Um, it is now 6.31. Uh, could I get a roll call, please? Esri? Here. Hurtado? Goss? Here. Harper? Here. Ingram? Present. King Taylor? McGuire? Patterson? Rector? Store? Summers? Here. Taylor? Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> Thorsland? Here. Tinsley? Present. Bacchaspati? Here. Wolken? Here. Young? Clemens? Clifford? Here. Cohort? Eisenman? And Rosales. Uh, here, uh, just wanted to take note that uh, also Stephanie Furtado just walked in as well. And I did receive some communication from Charles Young that he would not be here tonight. He had a, he's out of town uh, with a prior engagement. Uh, before I call up for the approval of the agenda, I would like to remove some items off of this agenda. The first one I would like to remove is item 7, 6, uh, let me see that, 7A6. Executive, uh, county executive requested that we remove the letter from, for the support of regard, uh, request for letter of support regarding application for extension of Village of Savoy, or Rantoul, I'm sorry, TIF district. That's item C. They uh, decided to pull that, it was on them, not so much on us, uh, 6C. And then I would also like to pull item nine, 3B, 93B under the ex, uh, county exec, uh, request approval of our county policies, drug use, information technology policy, and travel policy items one, two, and three. Okay, with those uh, pulling of those items on the agenda, off the agenda, I would like to go ahead and uh, request uh, somebody to approve. And move to approve the agenda, please. Uh, so moved by Prangel, second by Mike Ingram. All those uh, discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, next, approval of the minutes. Could I get somebody to move those as you breeze through them? Uh, moved by Stephanie, second by Lorraine Coward. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Okay, all those opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Finance, Jim Goss. Oh, I'm sorry, forget the public. No, just, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I'm jumping ahead of time here. Um, public participation, I don't have any flips here from any of the public. Any of you in the back row would like to step forward and address us? Seeing none. I guess we can jump to communication, board communication. I know that there was one, Prangel. Yeah, I wanna uh, congratulate uh, Stephanie Furtado and Kyle Patterson on winning uh, the Excellence in Local Government Award from the uh, Champaign County Healthcare uh, Consumers. Nice, great. Thank you for that, Prangel. Excellence in leadership. Um, Finance, Jim Goss, new business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight, uh, we've got Carly McC McCrory here from uh, Champaign County EDC, and she's gonna give us a presentation to start this evening. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, hi, Mike. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm here to talk about um, our organization, of which I am the executive director of, um, to tell you a little bit about what we've been working on this past year and what we have coming up. So um, there's uh, quite a bit on uh, some of these slides, and we'll follow up and send these out afterwards, too, so that we can go back and you guys can ask any follow-up questions as well. 
Um, but the organization overall, we're a public-private partnership representing uh, Champaign County, so we work a lot with our regional partners, all of the local municipalities, uh, Champaign County itself, um, and a lot of the private sector as well to really grow their regional economy in a variety of different ways um, through different programs and initiatives and also very uh, focused and strategic outreach efforts as well. So some of the areas that our organization focuses on and really that is kind of our bread and butter is uh, business outreach. So uh, part of the thing that our organization is charged with is uh, really attracting new businesses to Champaign County and then also working to retain the businesses that we have here. Um, so on a regular basis, we're um, answering requests for proposals, uh, both for companies that are looking to locate here that might not already be here, and for some existing businesses too who may already be in the community, but for one reason or another, they need to move to a different location, and so they may be looking at different space needs within the community. Um, we get these RF through a variety of different ways, sometimes through the state of Illinois, um, or just established relationships that we may have with site selectors or different company representatives as well. Um, but the other thing that we spend a lot of time doing is just going out and meeting with all of these individual businesses themselves through very structured outreach visits. So oftentimes we're boots on the ground, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with these companies in partnership with uh, folks like the university, Parkland College, and other uh, regional um, um, groups to really kind of learn exactly what it is from the business, some of their opportunities, but also some of the challenges that they have too. And based on those conversations, we take different actions. Um, so some of those actions might end up being that we host different business roundtables or different panels. Um, if we often hear that there's a common thread maybe across some manufacturing companies. Um, so a good example of that is um, um, a program that we worked to um, help facilitate. So when we were having um, some conversations with some manufacturing and distribution companies a few years ago, one of the things that they mentioned was that they really needed to find some additional forklift drivers. That that was a skill set that, that we were lacking here in the community and something that we needed to build up. Uh, so we uh, brought all those employers together who had mentioned this in our visits. Um, we took that information to Parkland College, and they have since developed a forklift training program on a short-term basis that folks can en enroll in um, and that local employers participate in so that there's a clear path uh, for once they earn this skill set and certificate that they can move directly in into an employment opportunity here locally. Um, so those are just kind of some examples of the things that we'll do with that information uh, when we're meeting with companies. Uh, we also have a variety of programs and events that we um, run out of our organization. Um, so one of the things that we participate in on a regular basis is uh, Champaign County First, which is a local group that represents both the public and private sector to go to Washington, D.C., and also Springfield on an annual basis to advocate for projects that are happening in Champaign County that oftentimes have federal or state funding attached to them. So um, for our agenda that we have coming up for our trip to D.C., we'll be advocating for projects like the yards in downtown Champaign and the automated vehicle autonomous track that is being proposed for the village of Rantoul. Uh, we also do a variety of different other things, um, representing a, a variety of different industries and employers in Champaign County. But one of the things that I wanted to point out um, that's up on the screen is the private job fairs. So anytime that there's a significant change in employment in the community, for example, one of the most recent examples um, is the Habaco situation when Habaco closed. We would work directly with that company to go in and help all of the impacted employees. And one of the ways that we do that is we typically host a private job fair for the empl employees that are impacted, where we bring in other companies in the area who are hiring um, so that we can make those direct connections and we can help those impacted employees find talent locally. Um, so Habaco was probably the most recent really kind of uh, a bigger amount of employees that were impacted, but we're currently working on um, this particular situation with Rockwell Automation, uh, who will be closing later this year too. Um, and we also host a variety of special guests in the community. Um, the top picture is um, the newly appointed DCEO director to the Department of Commerce for the state of Illinois. Uh, we hosted her in town last week uh, with her team to meet with local tech employers to help understand um, some of the programs and initiatives that the state could undertake that would have an impact locally and help our employers here in Champaign County. Um, and then at the bottom, that is a photo um, of a local student startup who was talking with the mayor of Urbana um, at a, a social that we held uh, last week. So 
one of the things that we do is we interact a lot with some of the programs and initiatives that are happening on campus. Um, so there's a lot of student startups that happen and spin out of the university, and we wanna make sure that they get out into the community kind of off the campus footprint so that they make connections and resources so that we can help them while they're here and they're growing, and then thus hopefully getting them to stay and grow and locate here in Champaign County. Um, one of the kind of bigger initiatives that we've been working on in partnership with some others, and this is really based on feedback again from the local employers, is this ICAT apprenticeship program. Now this was a program that we were introduced to actually by a local employer who was interested in having it deployed here locally because they had heard about it and really thought it would fit well within our county. Um, this is a program that is really geared towards manufacturing companies or companies that might have jobs you might typically find in a manufacturing or a distribution environment. Uh, this is a program that we're working to launch uh, this fall that'll be led between ICAT and Parkland College, but it provides a five-year opportunity for a high school graduate or anybody above the age of a high school graduate to um, move into a five-year track with a company where they can obtain um, their degree from Parkland College that the employer pays for, uh, also while earning money at the job at the company that they're with, getting a stipend while they go to school for the days that they're not at the employer, and then once they complete the program at Parkland College, they have a guaranteed two years of full-time employment at that company. So it really creates a good pathway and a model, um, and we are constantly looking and working to build the talent pipeline here. Um, so. Uh, anybody who might be interested in a career in like the manufacturing sector, while they're in high school, they could potentially take advantage of something that already exists like the Early College and Career Academy as a junior or a senior. And then once they graduate from that program, if hopefully they still have interest, they would move into something like the ICAT apprenticeship program at Parkland too and get their school paid for. Uh, one of our flagship events that we do on an annual basis is called Innovation Celebration. We kind of joke that it's the mini Oscars of Champaign County. We like to um, hand out a bunch of different awards. We have a red carpet, but really it's a celebration of all the companies and the innovation and the entrepreneurs that are doing really amazing things here in our community. So um, it, it's a night where we just celebrate them and really kind of tell the stories of what's happening in our own backyard. Um, and one of the cool things that, about this event is that for all of the finalists each year, we create videos that really kind of tell a highlight of the business, maybe why they're here in Champaign County, why they choose to locate here or start here. Um, and we use those all throughout the year for different marketing and branding purposes. But one of the things that is really nice is that a lot of these companies, for whatever reason, maybe it's just time or maybe it's financial resources, um, don't have these materials for themselves. And so it's really beneficial for the companies that end up as finalists, not only for the recognition that they receive in that regard, um, but for the materials that they receive afterwards. So a lot of these companies might use some of these videos when they're going to trade shows or making pitches to uh, angel investors or when they go meet with a bank to get local lending. So it's a really great resource that they have, um, and that's one of the events that we focus on on an annual basis. Um, we, we do kind of the typical stuff that you might presume. Uh, we do a lot of data management. So on an annual basis, we publish the top employers directory. Um, but one of the other things that we're constantly doing is working with local employers. And I put this map up here on the screen. This is a, a report called the Talent Attraction Report. And so any time that a local company may have some challenges in hiring for a very specialized or specific position, or maybe they need a lot of one position, um, they might come and say, where are some interesting areas around the country that I can look at? So this map actually represents um, RNs across the country, and the larger the bubble means the bigger the population of uh, people in those areas who have skill sets that would fit a typical RN job. Um, and so what this map tells us is a few different things. Um, it tells us maybe where to look for the talent, um, but we can also look at very specific data points like where our alumni are living. So um, it tells us how many alumni of either Parkland or the university live in a particular area. It tells us if there's a graduate oversupply. So there's people in those areas who have skill sets that are either underemployed or not employed. And the, one of the most important things is it tells us earnings gain. So it compares cost of living for those communities. So all of the data that we get in these types of reports really helps kind of paint the picture. Um, and it helps employers make the pitch to talent that they're looking to capture to locate here in Champaign County. 
Uh, we, we do a variety of different kind of general programming, uh, highlighting products and innovation that are made here, um, and also uh, working to um, help build awareness around what manufacturing looks like today versus what a lot of people think manufacturing looks like. So we'll do things like um, during the month of October, we always bring as many uh, junior high and high school students into companies so that they and their parents um, and anyone at the local schools, and it's really open to the public too, um, can see what some of these opportunities and some of these industries look like, um, the jobs that are there and kind of what they pay in the pay scale. Um, we're, we're involved too in a variety of different initiatives that we don't necessarily lead, um, but we participate in in a variety of ways. And there's a lot of work that has been done uh, recently in years um, to improve um, uh, Willard Airport. Not only the facility themselves and how you feel when you're in the terminal area, but to um, expand routes and add additional airlines too. So uh, we did a, we led an economic impact report that was done in 2016 to really kind of drill down and look at what impact Willard Airport has on our community. Um, we know it's important because it's rare that we meet with an employer who tells us otherwise. And on any RFP that I receive, um, any time there's a question, um, it's always about uh, air service too. So one of the things that we looked at when we did this report in 2016 was um, we drilled down into what a new route to Charlotte, North Carolina would look like. Um, and that really helped once we had that data in our conversations with different airlines and ultimately helped secure the uh, newest route via American Airlines to Charlotte, which launched in late 2018. And they just added a temporary second flight on May 3rd um, for a short period of time. But if you actually look at the booking calendar and try to book a flight to Charlotte past the temporary schedule, it allows you to do so. So that's a good sign um, that that second route will hopefully become permanent or at least extended throughout the year. Um, one of the other big things that we're constantly doing is just sharing the message externally, but of course internally as well about all of the things that are happening. Uh, one of the mediums for doing that is the You're Welcome CU campaign. Um, which is a campaign that brags about our history of innovation, our micro-urban community, and it's really to attract uh, companies and also talent to our community. Um, so the campaign is really kind of a website-based campaign, and we launched it in early 2016. So we have different iterations, um, but one of the most important components of it is that there's an online job board um, that's free for employers to access and use, and also a resources directory. When we were putting together the campaign, there were a lot of asks from employers about community marketing materials that they wanted to have to supplement their own uh, recruiting and attraction efforts. So we were very specific in some of the things that we chose to focus on, like cost of living, and the fact that um, when you look at here versus areas like Silicon Valley, uh, you can actually afford uh, to buy a house here, and you also have companies that are truly actually paying salaries that are comparable to the Bay Area, uh, which as we all know, it goes a lot further here than it would in the San Francisco area. So we developed all these different types of um, marketing materials that also highlighted things like the fact that we have invented the MRI, the LED, um, and even whipped cream in a can here in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, we also brag about uh, the companies. So Wolfram Alpha, if you ever talk to Siri on your iPhone, or if you're ever asking Alexa, Amazon's Alexa questions in your house, um, all of those answers are powered by Wolfram Alpha right here that is headquartered in Champaign-Urbana. So they uh, have the computational database that provides all those answers to everybody's questions. Um, and the other thing we do a lot too is, you know, it's our role to go out and talk about how awesome Champaign County is, but it also helps when other people validate it as well. So one of the things that we're constantly doing um, is using our community rankings that we receive, like Best Midwest Food Town, um, the fact that our um, uh, bus ridership tops that of much larger metro areas like Rockford and Indy and even Nashville, Tennessee, um, and that we have, we're actually growing in population as compared to other areas that are losing population, not only in this state, but in the Midwest as well. Um, and we use all of these messages to 
to craft different um, campaigns that is used in a variety of different mediums, whether it's paid media or billboards. We really have all of these kind of go-to things. Um, and the biggest thing is, is it's all totally open source. So anybody, whether you're an employer or maybe you're somebody who's looking to move to this county, um, you have access to all of this stuff completely free of charge. All you have to do is right click and download. Um, so we're constantly working to update these materials based on what the employers tell us they need um, to help supplement their own recruiting efforts as well. Uh, another big component of our center is that we house a small business development center. So we have two full-time staff members who are solely dedicated to the SBDC. Um, this center provides uh, confidential free business advising. So if you're looking to start a business, if you're in the middle of a business but you need help in a particular area, um, we provide uh, counseling at no cost. Um, so we do a variety of things, whether it's one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, we do a lot of different trainings and workshops. Uh, but another component of our SBDC that's particularly important for uh, Champaign County and the area is that we have an international trade specialist as part of our staff. Um, she is solely dedicated to helping companies export and import their products. Um, and so she works with a lot of uh, manufacturing companies here in the area. And that has been particularly important given what's going on with tariffs um, recently and under the current administration. So some of the highlights, we just released our annual report for the SBDC that you see on the right there. Um, but SBDC, they run on a different calendar year than us. So this is looking at January through December of 2018. You can kind of see some of our numbers there. Um, we had 55 business starts that happened from clients that we met with out of our center. We had around $32 million in capital infusion, which was the largest year that we've ever had due to some successful company exits here locally. Um, and some of the bigger things um, on the International Trade Center side are that we saw um, over 21 million in increase in exports from our area as compared to 2017, which is pretty significant. And we also had a lot more grants that were awarded through uh, the ISTEP program, which is a program by the Office of Trade and Investment at the state of Illinois that helps companies attend and offset costs to go to international trade shows to help market and advertise their products and their company. So that's a lot of what we've been working on the past year. Some of the things that we have in the works uh, cover a variety of different areas. Uh, I'll just point out a few here. One is um, we're constantly working on um, recruiting services. So anything that we do, we have very close working relationships with a lot of the HR professionals representing some of the top employers here in town. Um, and so we've been meeting with them on a pretty regular basis um, and we're ramping up some of our efforts um, into kind of how we work on and handle talent attraction, um, ultimately to grow this community and so that we can get more people to come here. Um, another thing that we're working on is launching uh, a coaching academy this summer at Douglas Branch Library in Champaign um, that will be geared towards those who are interested in entrepreneurship. And probably the biggest thing from an organizational standpoint um, that our board of directors is very heavily involved in is that we're working on a new strategic plan. Um, and so this is a, a, a graphic illustration that we did recently um, that um, a local illustrator artist basically uh, draws out what we're saying as part of the conversation. So you can see some of the big focus areas, the big bold letters of areas that we're working on as kind of our overarching goals for the organization, which match up with a lot of the things that we do already. Um, but we're working to really identify some areas of opportunity for our organization moving forward. Um, that So this new document and this new plan will kind of be our overarching goals and then really kind of the, um, the data and um, the goal setting and the numbers will be supported by an annual work plan that matches up with the overarching goals of the organization. So that's what we've been working on. I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Are there questions for Carly? Mr. Rector. Uh, thank you for your hard work and your staff. Um, I think you guys are doing a great job. And uh, props to the Board of Directors for promoting you with your commitment and your skill set and your local ties. I just I love it when the local groups like this can promote somebody of, uh, like you. So congrats, and I'm really glad you're running the organization. Thank you. Mr. Summers. Question on the, uh, the forklift operator training. Did any of the uh, local businesses provide any funding for this or did 
park and simply use their own funds or state funds or grant funds for the operation? So it was set up through um, Parkland College Community Education, um, and there is a fee for uh, participants to enroll. Um, some of the em local employers, especially the ones that would be hiring for these types of positions, they have donated um, in-kind stuff like materials and stuff to help um, uh, with the equipment and kind of the training process because it's a very hands-on training. Um, and then recently through Illinois WorkNet, um, this program was approved as well so that it can be approved for funds for p uh, people through the Illinois WorkNet Center who apply um, to receive reimbursement through that too. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Tanisha? Um, I want to say kudos as well. I love seeing tangible results, so <laughs> seeing a need in the community and then actually developing something that's helping that, so um, I appreciate that. I did have a question about the number of clients served. So out of the 420, do you have an estimate or a percentage of how many people of color that represents? I don't have the details with me, but we can follow up on them. Um, and then I see you also work with juniors and seniors in high school. Do you work with other community agencies like First Followers or anyone else in order to connect them to some of those programs as well? Um, not too much. For the Early College and Career Academy, um, that's a program that's actually run by, um, it's a partnership between Parkland College and uh, EFE 330. Um, so our interaction with them is working to help create marketing materials or really promote the program, especially to employers who sometimes take on uh, these high school students as um, interns in their organization. Um, but one of the things that we're looking at, and certainly as part of the strategic planning process, um, and especially also on the entrepreneurship side, um, is engaging more with some of those community organizations to help make sure that um, they know that the resources are available and that we're working together well to not duplicate efforts on some of those things too. Jody? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you also. Uh, I work at Frask International, and I've actually <laughs> attended some of the workshops there. I take care of um, contracts and export along with finance. And uh, my company has actually been awarded the ISTEP grant for uh, exports. So I think you guys do a great job. We've also worked with you um, on getting some interns, both, both of you of I and Parkland. So you guys have done a great job. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Frasca. Frasca um, brings in a, a student intern as part of the Early College and Career Academy that has led to some successful full-time hires as well. So, Ronjo. Yeah, uh, do you coordinate with uh, any of the local unions uh, for the forklift training or for anything else? Yeah, um, we're in uh, communication with them, um, and one of the things that we just um, started looking at is uh, working on um, some marketing materials for some of the summer construction programs that they have, um, and one of the ones that we're looking at now, um, Unit 4 is looking to expand. They've been building um, construction sheds during the summer with students and partnering with the local union to do that, and they're looking to move into some different avenues that could actually be... Um, building some structures that could be, then be used in the community. Um, so we're working with them on that effort. Um, but in a variety of different touch points, uh, we, can, we work with the unions in, in different ways, yeah. Anyone? Oh, Mike. Uh, how long have you been in the current position that you're in now? Uh, since July 1. July 1. Uh, 2018. Okay. Um, well, this is one of... I mean, I haven't been on the board for that that long, but uh, one of the better put together presentations and most informative that I've uh, been through so far. So I just want to say thanks for that, and I think it's a testament to uh, the decision that they made to put you in charge. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Carly. Thank Appreciate you. you being here. Okay, item A two. Budget amendments, transfers, uh, item A, budget amendment 19-00028 from Fund 075 Regional Planning Commission, Department 618 CC Regional Environmental Work Frame, increased appropriations of 80,000, increased revenue of 80,000, the reason state planning grant through IDOT to develop a regional environmental framework creating a centralized resource for Kuat staff to consistently manage ecological, social, and cultural re resources in the region. Is there a motion? Mr. Ingram, is there a second? Mr. Esri, 
discussion. I do know Rita is here. Rita, are you here for this item? Yeah, Rita is here if you have questions, specific questions. Does anybody have a specific question now that we've called her up here? <laughs> okay. Well, Thanks, wonderful. Rita. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, treasurer. Is the treasurer here this evening? I don't see it. She's got the March reports supposedly on the website. They weren't there on Friday. And, and there is no cash flow projection this month once again. Uh, auditor, the monthly reports for April are available. George, do you have anything you want to say this evening? Okay. Uh, item B, 4B, resolution authorizing interfund loans from reserves to other funds. Is there such a motion? Ms. Fortado, second. Ms. King, Taylor, sorry. I forget that we got King, Taylor, and Taylor. Uh, discussion about this item. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Okay, uh, this evening we've got uh, circuit clerk and circuit court. Katie Blakeman's going to give us a presentation on the Criminal and Traffic Assessment Act. This is for information only. However, we do have we do have to make a decision on this, and she'll give us the timeline. It's a lot of information, so I thought it might be helpful. Okay, go, Katie, go ahead. Okay. So while I am here to give you this presentation today, I want you to also know that uh, the court administrator, Lori Hansen, is here, as well as presiding judge Tom DeFanis, our sheriff, and state's attorney also are here to answer questions as it relates to how this uh, piece of legislation impacts their offices, uh, their departments as well. And, and Janie Miller-Jones, our uh, public defender. Sorry, Janie. <laughs> okay. Yes, Janie's here too. Um, so. If for those of you who don't know, the Criminal and Traffic Assessment Act is a landmark piece of legislation that was passed last year um, that pretty much completely overhauls the way that fines and fees are assessed in the state of Illinois, on uh, court fines and fees are assessed in the state of Illinois. Currently, um, it is a very complicated process um, whereby, you know, depending on what statute you are charged under in a criminal case, uh, you could be assessed a total of $500, or it could be $3,000, and it's and it's all dependent on uh, a variety of factors that ha that are so complicated that it's not very uh, transparent for defendants uh, in in court uh, because it is not possible to give them a uh, a full picture of what they would owe um, in the courtroom. So that is, and that was you know throughout the state. That's something that. Uh, that was a need that was seen by the uh, Court Fines and Fees Task Force um, that was established by the Access to Justice Act, uh, and that Court Fines and Fees Task Force created the, the initial drafts of this legislation, and it went through many iterations before landing uh, on, in the version that we have today. So <laughs> there's a lot here. Um, so some of this, um, some of the purposes uh, of the Criminal Traffic Assessment Act, this was also included in the memo uh, that you received, but it 
uh, some of the things that came out of that court fines and fee task force is that um, ideally courts should be funded uh, from general government revenue sources um, and court users may be required to pay reasonable assessments to offset a portion of the cost borne by the public at large, uh, cost of the courts. So th the purpose is that eventually the, the idea is for uh, the legislature to, I, they have not yet identified another revenue source, so for now we are operating almost entirely on court fines and fees. Um, the amount of the assessments should not impede access to the courts and should be waived to the extent possible for indigent litig litigants and the working poor. Assessments should be simple, easy to understand, and uniform to the extent possible. Assessments should be directly related to the operation of the court system. This is something that you would see uh, lately, it, before the passage of this act and before this it goes into effect. There are lots of fees that are assessed on uh, criminal cases where you will see uh, the one I like to always use is the George Bailey Memorial Fund. Uh, it goes to the state for some purpose that is not at all related to the prosecution of that case. Um, there are lots of those kinds of examples. Um, and so the idea was to streamline the list of uh, fines and fees that are assessed. And the General Assembly should then periodically review all assessments to determine if they should be adjusted or repealed. What was happening over the past 10 years especially is that you would see um, every session, every legislative session, there would be a new fine or fee added because some constituent would come to a legislator and say, oh, if we could just get $2 on this thing, and, and that added up uh, over a period of time and then became more and more cumbersome. Uh, so the purpose of this act was to streamline that, make it very easy. So, um, and then the the other major thing that was changed in this is the assessment waivers. So prior to July 1, you could only ask for a fee waiver on civil cases. So if you could not afford the filing fees, if you were filing for divorce, uh, you could fill out a petition for fee waiver and a judge would rule on it um, depending on income level and uh, that could be granted or denied. Now, uh, you can also file a petition for the waiver of assessments on criminal cases. It does not apply to the fine amount, but to those, uh, those what we used to call court costs. Um, and then there are both full and partial waivers. So if you can't afford uh, the full amount, but you could pay a, a smaller amount, there is uh, a 75% or 50% or 25% uh, partial waiver on both civil and criminal. And in the very back of your packets, you will see uh, the schedule of uh, what qualifies for those fee waivers. Um, and so this, uh, this flyer here, uh, we have many laminated copies of that that will be posted throughout the courthouse. Um, it's in right now just English and Spanish, um, but we're hopeful that they can at least provide one or two in French as well. Um, this did come from the, uh, the Supreme Court um, Civil Justice Division. And so we also have all of those uh, schedules. And that schedule, I, as I said, is in your packet. It does not apply, though, to traffic cases. So anything charged under the Illinois Vehicle Code does not uh, qualify for a waiver. So now into the fun part. In all of your packets here, uh, so I have provided for you a spreadsheet that shows you uh, for each of these schedules what, the, what we have currently charged on that case type. So I pulled a specific case and pulled this is what we charged on this case and what it would look like under the Criminal and Traffic Assessment Act. And then uh, so there is a total assessment. So for example, on this one, a generic felony, uh, the total assessment would be $549. Uh, the total that the county would retain of that would be $354. And then there is this piece that uh, I have called county distributed. So if, we, if you as a board do not designate where those funds will go, now they are to be spent, they will be assessed on all criminal cases, that amount will be assessed. Um, and Currently, we have all of these fees for things like court security um, and the state's attorney fee, and there, there are lots of these different things. Um, but in order to 
to make it easier, the legislature thought, well, we'll just give the county a lump sum. Unfortunately, if we do that and it just goes to the general corporate fund, there's not an easy way to track to be sure that, that those funds are spent on the operations of the courts. So what we have outlined here is how it could be distributed that is most closely aligned to the way it is currently assessed. So of that amount, uh, what is highlighted in yellow, uh, the total amount will be assessed either way, but how it is to be distributed is, is the question um, that can be determined by the county board. Most counties are adopting a, an ordinance uh, that lists, you know, here is what will be assessed on all of these schedules, and for the county portion, it states to be distributed as, and so it would be to be distributed as $40 for the state's attorney fee, uh, $25 for court security, and those things that are not set by the statute. So some of the, the county fees are set by the statute, some are set by the uh, circuit administrative order, um, and so, the, so those are set, but everything in yellow is not set. And so I have created um, these schedules for all 13 criminal uh, schedules and then all four civil schedules. Um, and I have given you also some examples of what those cases are. So, and a generic felony would be, as we have here, a murder case or burglary, identity theft. Those are some of the ones that we have, um, that would be considered a generic felony under these schedules. Under a felony DUI, that would be things like an aggravated DUI, um, a snowmobile DUI where there is a death, uh, or a watercraft um, operating under the influence where there is injury or death. Uh, so that those are some examples. So I have um, provided that for you. And then on each of these also, I've given you, um, it says whether or not that schedule is eligible for a waiver. Uh, so anything under the Illinois Vehicle Code is not eligible for a waiver. So a felony DUI would, would fall under the Illinois Vehicle Code, would mostly be considered traffic, so that would not qualify. Um, if you would like, I can go through all of these. Um, <laughs> I, I do have a, a series of riveting slides uh, for those, uh, but that is just so you can be aware. And we do, we do have multiple uh, examples there. Go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, just really quickly, mm -hmm. just for clarification, the fees are eligible for a waiver, but the fines are not. Is that the accurate? That is, that is okay. correct. So the fine, uh, when a person goes to court and upon sentencing, the judge can order a fine. Um, you will see that on here. Sometimes the case that we pulled had a fine. Sometimes it did not. Um, this Criminal and Traffic Assessment Act establishes minimum fines. Uh, so for criminal cases, that minimum fine is $75. On traffic cases, that is $25, um, but that the judge has full discretion uh, on the fine. So whether there is a fine or not and what the amount uh, should be is, is, is fully um, decided by the judge. And then the judge can also waive those assessments in full or partially um, according to the income guidelines um, and with a petition. So the defendant would be required to file a petition for that within 30 days of sentencing. What is the pleasure of the board? Do you want her to go through each one of these individually, or do you, would you rather just ask questions at this point? I can also get to the civil schedules, because there there yeah. is some difference in the civil schedules. Yeah, I think we should, should okay. at least get, because there is some differences there. Are there Fair. questions on the criminal side? Yeah, yeah, sorry, could you just explain the difference between county and county distributed? I think that's Yes, yeah, so the total amount, so under each of these, so there's a total assessment that is $439, so uh, on this generic misdemeanor. There's a portion that would go to the state, there's a portion that would go to the arresting agency, and then the county would retain $282 of that. And what is to be distributed is that that is not those specific fees, where there are specific fees that are set by the statute, um, or by administrative order, so our court automation and document storage fees are set by circuit administrative order, and then things like the state's attorney automation and public defender automation, probation operation assistance fund, those are all set by the statute. 
it would by default go into the general fund. Yeah. That is on the criminal. And then uh, we will get to the civil. There's some really interesting ones under conservation, in which in Champaign County we get about 20 per year. Uh, we don't have a lot of topography in this county, no uh, large bodies of water for recreation, uh, so we don't see a lot of those. But uh, then when we get into civil schedules, there is a difference between the filing fee, which means, so if you are filing for divorce and you're the person who wants to divorce your spouse and you file, uh, or if you are a bank who wants to foreclose on a property, uh, your filing fee, the first thing you file, you pay uh, this filing fee. And that is, um, and there are different different schedules for all of those case types currently, um, but they're far more broken down. I think we have, I, I mean, under the probate section alone, I think there are 16 different types of fees. So this would dramatically streamline the way it is assessed and would be much clearer for the filer. Um, and then there is also an answer fee. So the person who is responding to that uh, complaint. The first thing they file, there is an answer fee, and that is always less than the filing fee. So under the civil, let me get to that section here, uh, you will see um, there is the total to be assessed. Uh, that is actually in com conjunction with um, what has to be assessed is the $11 to the state treasurer, and then the $45 that is to be assessed for the uh, court automation, document storage, and clerk operation and administrative fund, and the $17 for the law library fee. The other county, where I put county distributed, the county can assess up to $250 on that. So that amount also has to be set by the county board. If it is not set by the county board before June, before the end of June, we will not be authorized to collect any filing fees other than the ones that are uh, set by the statute or administrative order. So uh, though this bill was passed last year and uh, there are some parts of it that were known, we did not get the civil schedules from the Supreme Court until March and we got the, uh, the section on uh, the Article 5 rules under Traffic uh, 529, which is ma the, those traffic cases that do not require court appearance, we did not get those rules until April. Uh, so we have been trying to come up, <laughs> come up with these schedules in the meantime. Uh, so on each of the civil schedules, it outlines for you um, those sections. And then the law library fee will be assessed whether or not uh, that whether the county board does something or not. However, um, it can be part of that, it can be part of that up to $250 or it can be on top of that additional $250. So my understanding from talking uh, with county board members at the finance agenda review meeting is that it would be the will of the board to include that in the total, not on top of. Um, so that, that is a decision you can make. Um, I have begun drafting an ordinance uh, that could be ready for, uh, for next Thursday that would outline all of these things, but I did not want to get any farther with the ordinance until the discussion, uh, since until you'd had a chance to get this information uh, and to absorb it. So then on the civil schedules, we have, and the, it does also give you case types under those schedules. Uh, so the larger uh, civil schedule one with the highest fees would be things for municipal corporation cases, tax cases, chancery, which is foreclosure or divorce. And then in, as you get into the second schedule, it goes down. So state cases, eviction cases, except possession only. Uh, so the landlord is filing a, an eviction case for possession only, that amount uh, is lower. But if it is for damages in addition to possession, uh, it would be it would fall under civil schedule two. And then small claims that are higher than twenty five hundred dollars. 
then uh, under Schedule 3, these are the much smaller cases. So small, small claims cases, eviction where there's possession only. And then there are no fees under Civil Schedule 4. That is for adoptions, wills, and orders of protection, uh, which we currently do not charge anything for. It. Those, are, those are set by, um, by the uh, Supreme Court rule on that. So <laughs> that's a lot of information. Um, what can I answer for you? Question, Pranjal. Yes. Uh, yeah, how, how does like the bottom line number for the civil schedules compare to the existing bottom line? It's the same or? Um, it's close. Okay. It's close. Um, it may be slightly different, um, but it is also uh, the intent uh, is to offset the waivers uh, because the, the people who do not qualify for waivers, most of the people file paying these filing fees that, that are, are set here are law firms from Chicago who are dumping large numbers of small claims cases on us, like 50 a day. So it, the people who cannot afford to pay the filing fees have multiple options. Stephanie. Just to make sure I'm, I'm reading your chart correctly, so back to Civil Schedule 1, the difference between current, this case, it would have been $237 under the current schedule and 295 under the your the recommended changes is that a correct reading of this chart? Okay, so where you're looking? I'm sorry, at civil civil one under the uh -huh. filing, the mm -hmm. total the total county. Um, oh, the total county. Okay, that would be 237 and then 295. Yes. So that that's the diff that would be the yeah, difference. Yeah, but the total assessments are 248 and then 306. So actually, the the percentage that comes from that is more uh, to the county. Well, I guess yeah. I can only look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's very similar. I just I just want to make sure I was reading because mm -hmm. it, it yeah. It, okay. Mr. Storr. Thank you. <coughs> uh, it, under the new. Uh, uh, way that this will be a, a, a new assessment. Uh, will the difference? What, what will the difference amount to uh, in terms of uh, what will come to maintain the courthouse and 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 for the county? So we have uh, tried to do some predictive modeling on that. Unfortunately. It's going to be very difficult to predict because the waivers, we just simply don't know how many people will choose to file those waivers. Um, I would imagine that I, that they would be granted on a large number of felony cases. Um, but right now, we aren't collecting a lot on felonies anyway. When a person goes to the Department of Corrections, they're not able to pay those those uh, fines and court costs. So. Uh, I, th I would say our collection rate on fel felonies is far lower than any other case type. Uh, it, it's just very difficult to predict because we can try to, we have numbers of cases that that fit these categories, but they were by statute and it has been difficult to predict. We've, the, the analyses we have done over the, the life of this bill, I've done several different analyses like this and tried to model it out. Um, it looks like the county would end up pretty similar to what we are, are currently receiving, but we don't really know how the fee waivers will impact it until that goes into effect because we don't know um, how many of those cases will qualify. Just like we can't really predict how many cases will be filed. You know, that's the, the difficulty when we prepare a budget every year. You know, it's like, well, how many traffic cases are there going to be? I can't, I can't tell you how many tickets uh, police officers will write um, in a given year. So I wish I could give you more information on that. But I, the way the analysis I had done before uh, the waivers, the waiver section was added was that we would be about the same. Uh, but with the waivers, it's it's really hard to tell. 
Other questions, comments? I notice, and when it compares the current to the uh, BCAA, sometimes it'll be blank in one or the other. Is is that because the new law expands the ability to find for that or restricts it, and the vice versa? Um, okay, so like under Civil Schedule Two, there is not currently an answer fee for those case types. Well, there are in some there are, and some there aren't. The case that we pulled. There were no answer fees in that case. And like I said, like with probate, we have 16 different levels of, of fees. So it, it's hard to pull that in. Uh, but those will be, there will be an appearance or answer fee um, under the CCAA on uh, the civil schedule too. And you said the answer fee? Yes. Am I looking so at it's, the right? it's called, under the act, it's called appearance. So appearance fee, but that's the same thing as an answer fee. It means the person who is, the, when they are re responding to a lawsuit or someone filing uh, for divorce, they have to answer that, and the first thing they file is is called an appearance. Okay. Yeah. Is that? Anyone else? Any questions for our other guests? If, since they came here, which I very, very much appreciate. Our state's attorney says no, she doesn't have any answers. So uh, if you would like me to continue to work on that ordinance, I can have it ready for next Thursday. But if there is, if there are concerns about what we have outlined, I can, we can talk with uh, the fellow department heads about how that Mr. Storer. Kind of a slow thinker and reader, sorry. Uh, I, I wonder if the uh, defense, Defender's office will. Uh, I mean, are, do, are there waivers for the fee, waivers now for these fees? Not on criminal cases, no. Okay. There, there is no waiver for assessments on criminal cases. On civil. On civil, yes. Okay. So the defend the uh, public defender might uh, call this sort of. Uh, eligibility to for waiver to clients attention I would I would expect that would be pretty diligent yeah, thing on their part wouldn't it yes we would alert our clients that they have the opportunity to fill out a fee waiver and I understand there'll be a form at some point in time that we can provide to our clients and then it would be their decision whether or not they wanted to provide get the documentation together to go with the form to provide to the court for a fee waiver. Uh, Franjal was first. Oh well. Okay go ahead follow to, up. To, to follow up uh, I would guess that many of your clients fall into the indigent or, uh, or or might might qualify for a waiver? I imagine that I would expect about 90% of our clients would probably uh, be eligible for some type of a fee waiver. Probably not 100%. Some of our clients would qualify for that, but not the vast majority, I don't imagine. I'm going to belabor this, Ms. Blakeman. Uh, does that kind of change your uh, uh, anything that you kind of had to say about whether this is going to balance or not? I, I would say I, I still think it's very difficult to predict because, I mean, we're I wouldn't say we're collecting a lot from public defender clients right now, so maybe if. If they are then given the ability to have a reduced assessment, they might and to set up payment plans, they may be able to complete that and and actually 
comply with the conditions. What happens if they don't pay? Just it uh, goes to collections, um, and it can go to the um, the Illinois State Comptroller uh, through the local debt recovery program uh, that can intercept Illinois state tax refunds. Um, it can intercept state um, state employees' wages or state contracts. Um, but is it I I don't know how often that necessarily. It, it, we do not. I, State's attorney does not revoke probation for non-payment. Um, so nobody's going to jail for not paying, I guess. Well, yeah, sometimes, though, they are revoked for non-payment of restitution, not for court costs and fees or probation mm -hmm. services. But if our clients don't pay restitution, oftentimes they are revoked. A petition revoke is filed, and then they can be resentenced on that for willful failure to pay their restitution. Okay, Pranjal, you had you were next, and then Tanisha. Yeah, just another thing I'm noticing here, in um, most of these is a substantial increase in the um, amount of fees going towards the state's attorney's office, but there's little to no increase in the funding for the public defender's office. So the, the public defender's office does not currently have a – Public Defender Automation Fund, we do not currently assess anything from the Public Defender's Office unless it, it is ordered under a conditional assessment, uh, which is the Public Defender, uh, what's the fee? Right, the the court-appointed counsel fee. The court-appointed counsel fee. That's a conditional, and that's not affected by this act. Um, those uh, assessments um, were, those are primarily set by the statute. So the statute is set for $2 for the Public Defender Automation $2 for state's attorney automation. Um, and then the county distributed, we have we have proposed that that remain the same as what has is currently been assessed um, on those criminal cases under the state's attorney fee. The court-appointed counsel fee, though, does not come to my office. It goes to the general corporate fund. So it's not revenue for my office. We don't get that money to use to run our office or to we do anything to with it. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just looking. You know, I look at generic felony schedule one. State's attorney gets forty bucks, and uh, public defender automation, and and in addition, two bucks for automation, and ten bucks for the child advocacy center fund, and all the public defender gets is two bucks for, uh, you know, automation, and that seems sort of like, you know, just a little bit of a. <laughs> yeah, I didn't write the bill, but yeah, uh, that is, yeah. Public defender distribution is not affected by this new statute. They're, they're, nothing changes for them from how it is to how it's going to be, but they get more. They get something they didn't have before. What, what this, what you have to do is distribute what used to be distributed already for you and is now a lump sum and what the circuit clerk is suggesting is that you distribute it the same way it was distributed before. So the state's attorney's office is not getting anything more than we had budgeted before by statute. And the public defender's office is not losing anything that they had budgeted before by statute because they're not even in this distribution pool. But they are actually getting something that they didn't have before, which is the automation fee. So okay, okay, I understand the sense? second part, but for the first part, it does say you know in most of these that the total state's attorney distribution is going up. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, you know, if if, if we look just at the first one, it says going from forty two to fifty two. Um, sorry, that's the second. That's felony DUI. Uh, no, but for the generic felony, it goes from forty two to fifty two. For felony DUI, it goes from forty two to fifty two. Right. For felony drug, it goes from forty two to fifty two. Same for felony sex. Same for for generic misdemeanor, it goes from twelve to twenty five. 
Um, and I mean, our county distribution is going up nearly, uh, you know, 80 bucks, for example, for a generic misdemeanor. So is that us getting more revenue or is it not us getting more revenue? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where you're looking because this one that I'm looking at under state's attorney county portion, current is 40 and new is 40. There, there's one where it stays the same, but on, yeah. And under felony I'm, I'm looking at, at sort of the bottom 40, line to 40. the state's attorney. Oh, that's probably just a form of monopoly on the revenue. Um, maybe. What? No, because if I look, oh, I guess maybe now because there's money going to the Child Advocacy Center Fund. Yeah, because that's including the Child Advocacy Center and the, the state's attorney operation. So all of that together, yes, it should be included. Oh, but the state's attorney fee is still the $40. So, so previously there wasn't money going to the Child Advocacy Center Fund? Yeah, so the Child Advocacy Center Fund and the state's attorney automation are set by the statute. Uh -huh. And so if you combine those three, the state's attorney fee, the Child Advocacy Center, and the state's attorney automation, yes, that is 52. But, but previously there was no money going to the Child Advocacy Center. Right, but that is set by the statute. Okay, okay. And so maybe this, your, your spreadsheet, as much as I love your spreadsheet, um, and appreciate you putting the Child Advocacy Center under my office. It's technically not. Okay, really so, so own, currently own of department. the $40 that you get, zero of those dollars go to fund the Child Advocacy Center. Correct. Okay. So I, I would say this is a good thing that the Child Advocacy Center gets funded because I'm a fan. Tanisha. I'm backing up a little bit because my question was before this wonderful discussion. Um, what forms or documents are required when filing for a fee waiver? And I wondered if any additional barriers will be created when people are attempting to get that waiver. Um, the, the form is provided by the Supreme Court uh, Standardized Forms Committee. It has been created. It is just not live yet because the, it does not go into effect until July 1st. Um, it's currently available on our website, on the, state, uh, the Supreme Court uh, Standardized Forms website. And we always have paper forms uh, for people to fill out in our um, bank of paper forms in the, in the front uh, near our office. Um, and our counter staff and the self-help center will all have copies of that, of that form. Um, so we routinely hand those out to people who express uh, concern about the filing fees in a civil case. So we say, oh, here's a, you know, this is a fee waiver form that you can complete. Um, and it has the income guidelines fairly clearly outlined on there and, and has, uh, there's a plain language review uh, by the Supreme Court uh, Forms Committee and it, they have instructions. They have very clear instructions. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean like their access to the forms or them okay. being able to get it, but the re additional documentation that might be required in order for them to receive the waiver. Like in order to be eligible for this, please provide okay. us with X, Y, and Z. Do we know I, what it's those not are? any additional information that th than what they would have filled out in the the civil fee waiver form, uh, from what I from what I understand. Have you seen anything different? Yeah, it, it's really it's an affidavit, is what it is. So they're just affirming that this is my income or if they receive SNAP benefits, or if they receive any assistance for anything, um, that is a qualifier. So uh, that it, it can be, a, you know, if later on someone were to find out that the person did not, in fact, qualify, that there could be a, I don't know what you would do in that case, <laughs> but I don't, I think it, it, it's not something that happens very often. Okay, Stephanie. Uh, just for a point of clarification, going back to the state's attorney fee, and this is not in the child advocacy fund, starting in generic misdemeanor schedule five, the state's attorney, state's attorney fee is increased by five. Uh, the misdemeanor DUI, it's increased by 30, but then in the misdemeanor drug and schedule seven and the misdemeanor drug, Schedule eight is reduced by five. So it, is, it isn't, I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear, that it isn't necessarily 
it's static. not necessarily right. the exact yeah. amount. Right. What it is is the closest we can right. get with the amount that we can distribute, exactly. yeah. um, given the other things that we need to distribute right. to. And, and so I think that's just an important point is that you tried to, to keep it as similar as possible. However, with the way this, the statute is written, there, it, there does in some cases have to be some fluctuation because I don't want it to be the case where down the road somebody's like, wait, this was $5, you know what I mean? I don't want, it to, I don't want us to say everything exa is exactly apples to apples. And I, yeah. I think also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the effort here is to, as conservatively as possible, raise some of the fees a little bit in, because we know that more of them are going to be waived. And on, so in on some the civil schedules, yeah, yes. right, yeah, yeah, on the civil. I'm sorry, yes, on the civil schedule. So mm -hmm. to sort of, without being able to predict because there's so many variables, but that is one of the considerations that you had: how to be reasonable in the fees that we collected, but also and that recognizing is consistent with what every other county right. Right. I have spoken to is right. doing. Right. Um, and and the last thing I want to say is I know this was a lot of work trying to trying to come up with ways for us in to understand this. So thank you for that. Thank you. I tried. I hope it's <laughs> for a lot Go of ahead, information. Um, you said in the uh, statutory report to the task force that one of the recommendations was that assessments should be directly related to the operation of the court system. Assessments imposed for a particular purpose should be limited to the types of court proceedings that are related to that purpose. Did the actual legislation that went through reflect any of those uh, aspects? Well, I will say that there are far fewer state fees that are completely unrelated. Um, so as you go through this, you're not going to see the George Bailey Memorial Fund. Any now you do see the State Police Merit Board Fund, and I will say the State Police Lobbyist is very, very good at his job. Um, so <laughs> that part, uh, there are more state fees than there probably should have been, or that was the intent of the statutory court fee task force. Um, but it is more closely aligned to what is actually happening in that case. So you'll see uh, in a felony sex case, there, are, there is a specific fee or fund that is related to that at the state level, rather than uh, the fire truck revolving loan fund, which is another one I missed. Sure, okay. thanks. This is very confusing and down to the less confusing. Okay. I am happy to answer other questions at any time. Yeah. Um, you know, you can email me anytime. Um, um, one more. Sure. Go. Yeah. Um, I arrived late, so I'm sorry if this question seems silly. But I just was noticing um, under misdemeanor DUI Schedule 6, the fine is currently $750, and then it will go down to 75 So what what I have done there is to put, so the, the fines on the criminal and traffic assessments schedules are set, at, there is a minimum fine. So what I put was the minimum fine. We don't know what would be assessed because that is up in, up to the judge entirely. Um, and so if it was a $750 fine in that particular case, it was a case that I pulled, a real case that I pulled. Okay. Um, I, I can't give you an average on those, of what would have been, because they are all so different and weren't in any particular schedules. It was very uh, piece by piece. Every case is assessed totally differently, um, with the exception of traffic cases that are paid um, that do not require court appearance. That's the only exception. Everything else is all over the place. Okay. There was just such a huge difference. That yeah, you know, so it could still be the same amount. Okay. It's just that there is a minimum fine of $75. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Esri. Yes, thanks. Um, Katie, I, I too would like to say thanks for presenting this to us and it sounded like you were kind of asking a little bit for direction. I'll obviously just speaking for myself, I guess based on what I've seen here, I personally would welcome a resolution at the next, at the full county board meeting personally, um, laying forth how, how you've got it presented here. Okay. Um, sounds, I mean, yeah, you're doing the best you can to keep it the way it was and that sounds pretty equi equitable <laughs> at this point in time. But now I do have one quick question, but would we be able to change that, I assume, like year to year or budget to budget? or Well, so you the know criminal traffic that would be the only question itself uh, has a sunset date, which is 18 months after it is enacted. Um, there are some reporting requirements during that time. Um, 
and then the legislature will be assessing whether it is accomplishing what they intended for it to accomplish. Um, after that, you know, we can draft the resolution or ordinance uh, to say that it also sunsets in 18 months, and, but it could also be renewed at that time after the assessment of uh, what the impact to the county has been. And we will be tracking that very closely. Mr. Esri, is that a motion? If you, if so desired, yes, I would make move that I would move that Ms. Blakeman continue with um, putting together a resolution um, following the way it's outlined before us today, and I guess I would say to make it well, but I don't know if we can take since it's information only. I don't know if we can really take a motion, can we? Like this, kind of just a straw. We I guess we can take me take a straw poll. What we we can it. only do a motion to tell her to advance the, the project. We can't vote yeah. on this. We can tell her to advance to to reduce it to ordinance. Okay. Yeah, so in that case, I would continue. Yeah, and I guess I would add, I get, if it needs to be, um, to make it concurrent the 18 months, does that make sense? Or, well, or just, that's, that just present, present the, pre yeah, that just present the, yeah, to just move it All you're doing the, is asking yeah. her to, to bring sure. forward an ordinance. Sure. Is there a second? Mr. Harper, discussion on the motion on the floor. Uh, Mr. Ingram. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, when the defender was up here, um, he did mention uh, to her that that was uh, when talking about where the, the $2 they get go, um, that that's something that you should change. At least that was the way that you well, phrased that it. Well, that is how I believe that the, the county should be. Th so all of the, the fees that come to our department, some are a special revenue fund and have entirely separate budgets. Uh, but in some departments, those are lines, they're revenue lines, and I would suggest that all of these um, have revenue lines uh, rather than just going to the general revenue fund, because then there's no way to track what you are collecting and being able to spend it directly on the operations of your office. Um, that would be a question for administrative services on how to accomplish that, but... Okay. Uh, it should be able to be done. Uh, yeah, I, didn't know I personally feel it should be on all of those. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, nay? Okay, I will work on an ordinance. If you have other suggestions, um, I can provide you with an example of one um, that from another county, uh, but I can have a draft ready. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, we just gave you a big job I, by yeah. next Thursday. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. It's a very difficult subject, and so much of it is stuff that way over our head if we're not used to looking at it. So, Okay, now we're down to County Executive uh, Resolution Adopting Champaign County Financial Policies. Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Esri, second Ms. King Taylor discussion. Um, I would I would start by saying that it's been lined out here. Just just the very few changes. Most of it is title changes. So um, this is basically what we've been used to in the past. Mr. McGuire, I would make some comments. Thank you, Jim. Um, first, we go through this every year, and and this is uh, primarily the same thing. Um, all the department heads are here, and the judges, uh, as county board members, we listen to um, the budgets for all, all these departments and organizations each year. And this policy doesn't have any enforcement for maintaining a uh, balanced budget, but every year everybody wonders what their budget's going to be and how much money we're going to be able to spend. and. Uh, where the increases will come from. But uh, in two major areas, it talks about our general fund, which was the big discussion of the five-year forecasts uh, last meeting, and our capital fund, um, capital plan for facilities, which we haven't had for a long time. Um, and the in the five-year forecast, we were forecasting that within, again, five years, be down to seven percent of reserve for our capital capital reserve and while we're building a decent capital 
uh, reserve. Um, when, when we're talking about um, changing budgets or increasing budgets for any one of the departments, um, whether circuit clerk, county clerk, or whatever, that money, obviously, when we only have a future that looks at 7% reserve, we really don't have any money. Um, it's got to come from somewhere. There's either got to be more revenue or there's got to be cuts. Um, Misty's here. We're going to talk about reentry. In years past, the only money we've ever had left over has been um, that that hundred thousand dollars or two hundred fifty thousand for youth assessment center to cut. That was the only reserve that we had. If um, the um, youth detention center needs a roof, that's three hundred thousand um, dollars. If if there's a cut, we always know it's staff. So, so where does the money come from if there's more spending, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand? If there's a mandate from the state, if they sweep some of our money, where does the money come from? So, so my question would be, if if there's a department or a line that requires uh, five percent more or two percent more of their budget, I think that should be part of this policy. That 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 if there's a request, there's either got to be more revenue for that change or that, that department has to come up with cuts for that, for that change in their budget. Um, because, you know, we're kind of the referees here. We've got to figure out where that money's going to be, where that money's going to come from. And, I, and it doesn't matter whether it's deputies or elections or whatever it is, they're important things one way or the other, but if it, if it has to be purchased, if, if, if it has to be paid for, we've got to come up with the money to pay for it because we can't do the same thing we did at the nursing home and just run this county out of money. We can't sit here in six or seven years and go, where is the money? Where is the money to pay for a roof, a building, or, or our staff and start cutting staff? So the question would be is can we set up a policy in this that says you either come up with cuts, we come up with revenue, or it requires a 15 vote um, majority or 15 votes to add that, um, pass that part of the budget. That would be my motion. So that's that's a motion is what you're putting forward. Hey, did you did you get down enough of that? <laughs> could could you please restate that? Because I don't think anybody was prepared for you to put forth a motion. And I, it's it's actually an amendment to a policy, so it's an amendment to this motion because we're trying to pass this policy. So it'd be if a department uh, would like to increase their budget greater than two percent. They would have to come up with a revenue source, or cuts to their budget, or that, it, or that budget would require a 15 vote majority. 15 votes to pass. Hey, you got that? Okay. Is is there a second to that amended portion to the policy? Ms. Wolken, discussion. Uh, Mr. Storr. <clears throat> I, I, I rather can't, am inclined to think that uh, something of the nature of what the Honorable Mr. McGuire is proposing could be handled through uh, zero-based budgeting, uh, perhaps implemented by department, maybe not over the whole county at once, but work department by department, rather than trying to uh, predict some things that, that may occur, may or not occur in a particular year. Uh, I think that there's, I think there's a better ways of, uh, of trying to accomplish what M Mr. McGuire would like. 
I, I do know from the from the chair's seat here, I know we've talked about zero based budgeting and until we end up on a much better financial system, it's not possible. So I mean, yeah, well in theory we're gonna get one, but that's gonna be a while. So we're not gonna be anywhere close to that. Zero based budgeting. Other discussion. Um, Mr. Patterson. I guess just more clarity on the motion. Um, you said a 2% increase, they would have to, so if their budget's going to increase by 2%, they would have to cut? Because if they're going to cut, then there wouldn't be an increase, right? Would it have to be more revenue or, or a cut? I mean, you're going to be taking the money from somebody else's budget where there's going to be some more revenue somewhere else in the budget to pay for it. So, I mean, as Jim just said, as other people know, there's only so many more new dollars coming into the county as tax revenue. So where, where are the dollars coming from that we're going to, additional dollars coming from that are going to be spent? They're, they're coming from one department or the other. They're coming out of one pocket or somebody else's pocket. So if you're going to increase spending, it's got to come from somewhere. It's either going to be cut, it's going to be, and if we're going to make these decisions, it's going to take more thought, and the only thing way it's going to take more thought is more votes. Uh, Ms. Fortado. Uh, just to be clear, most of our budget, especially our general fund budget, is driven by personnel. In a given year, there might be more than a 2% personnel increase in a budget just because of either um, CBA agreements or votes that we put together on staff. We've heard conversation that we have compression amongst um, our classification. So we might be looking at every single department under this, and then we would be seeding um, the entire budget to a 15 vote budget. The budget statute is 12 votes, amendment is 15 votes, it's worked fine, and there's no reason to change it. Other discussion? One last shot at this because whether you, you, that was one of my unfunded mandates I was talking about. Just because somebody mandates we spend money doesn't mean I have the money to spend it, it's just not there. I'd like to do a lot of different things in this county. But when you still don't have the cash, it doesn't matter. You can still, that, that's what I'm trying to do is keep us from going broke. Okay, last discussion on the, amend, the amendment that's been proposed. Okay, we're going to vote on the amendment. So all in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, let's go to hands, please. All those in favor? So it, the motion, well, I guess we should technically get the nay side. Go ahead. Motion fails. Motion, or the amendment fails. Okay, now we're back to the financial policy as presented. Any discussion on the financial policy? Mr. Patterson. Uh, were there any changes besides uh, obviously switching administrator to um, uh, b b executive? Uh, Ms. Ogden. The changes are reflected um, in blue. The strike, the uh, you can see along the left edge um, so the travel pol a reference to the travel policy was added under the introduction. And then under capital asset management and replacement, there was just some title change. And then under purchasing and encumbrances, um, there was just a reference to the statute for quality-based selection. And then under salary administration, a title change also. Um, it, I don't think it's a new statute, but there were recent updates to it where the uh, min minimum was increased. And then there's also um, growth allowed by the CPI in each fiscal year. I got one. Uh, Mr. McGuire. Uh, the only other one which I told Darlene about is uh, government funds account. Uh, proprietary funds and business type nursing home fund is the county's only enterprise zone 
enterprise fund? Yeah, we d we do still actually have a nursing home fund. So, we still can. Yeah, so we'll have to leave that until we totally get that done. Uh, other discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the financial policy as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Okay, item 6B, resolution authorizing the FY 2020 bud budget process. Is there such a motion? Mr. Rector, is there a second? Second, Mr. Clemens, discussion. Ms. Fortado. I'm going to move an amendment. If you turn with me to page 22, underneath the section that says property tax levy, um, I want to insert a new section. It says um, it will read as follows, and I can give this to you so you don't need to worry. I have it typed out. Capital Asset Replacement Fund will be the new title. Underneath it will say Capital Asset Replacement Programs have an impact on the General Fund and Public Safety Sales Tax Fund. In progress commitments for inclusion in the FY 2020 CARF budget, colon, number one, funding for maintenance scheduled in FY 2020 per the county's facilities capital plan, semicolon, and two, funding for enterprise resource planning, ERP, to replace the county's in-house financial system, semicolon, and three, funding for other CARF equipment and items previously scheduled for replacement in 2020, semicolon, and and four, an estimated calculation of full reserve funding required for future CARF replacement schedules. Then, going to general fund, I would like to make uh, the end of that sentence now be a comma with the following sentence, and the recognition of the need to provide the necessary equipment and software for an accessible, safe, and secure election in 2020. Seconded by Mr. Patterson, discussion. Go ahead, speak to your uh, amendment. Just to speak to the amendment, um, the language that I inserted under the CASP Capital Asset Replacement Fund was in the original draft of this resolution. Um, nothing in there are, um, is anything that we have not already committed to as a, reboard, as a board, in some cases repeatedly, and in particular, the ERP um, is something that I think, um, and that we as a board, we've already, um, this year, are spending money to put together the bid process for that. Um, and I think it is essential, especially for our financial staff, um, to have that. And it was in the original draft that we saw in the um, finance meeting. The second thing is in recognition of um, the immediate need um, for making sure that we have the voting equipment uh, for a, a secure election in 2020. Uh, you will note that there's not a dollar amount on, on that item. Um, it's just putting it into the consideration of the budget amendment, and I will also say that this is a guideline amendment of the board articulating to the county executive um, our priorities for the budget, um, but it is just our guideline uh, that will give the county executive, um, then has the authority to s start creating the budget. Um, so, you know, this is advisory is, is what it is, and, frank and frankly, aspirational, so it's, it's what we're hoping to have happen, recognizing that um, that decisions will have to be made within these categories. Discussion. Ms. Eisman. I'm sorry. Can you will you please repeat the amendments without the punctuation marks in it? I was focused on the punctuation. That sure. Sorry oh, for that. Okay, never mind. So there's the four things under the CARF okay. are funding for maintenance scheduled in 2020 per the county's facilities capital plan. So this is already things that are um, scheduled in our facilities capital plan. Two is funding for the enterprise resource planning, ERP, to replace the county's in-house financial system. So you'll recall um, this year we moved, we had already voted for money for this and we moved it into personnel in order to put together a good sort of uh, RFP bid process to make sure that the new system we got actually meets our needs. Um, and this is the system we would need in place in order to do things like uh, zero-based uh, budgeting. Four, or three was funding for other CARF equipment and items previously scheduled for replacement in 2020. So this is just following that capital asset replacement fund 
that, as Jim mentioned in the past, we had not been doing, but we want to get back onto. And then four is an estimated calculation for full reserve funding required for future calf replacement. So actually putting that money in that we said that we were going to put in um, in order for future uh, car, uh, capital asset replacement so we don't in the future end up in emergency situations. Um, so I, th I think that those were four good things that we worked pretty hard as a board to get in and, and, and work together to get, and I don't think that they should have been taken out, and so I'm putting them back in. Other discussion? Uh, Mr. McGuire. Thank you. Um, the line for the county clerk's office has a voter registration equipment line in in there already and I thought they had another line for their voter equipment um, so I'm not sure why we're being duplicative uh, I also thought that last year we filed for some grants for voter equipment um, and that there was pursuing some grants for voter equipment and that they were trying to rotate um, voter equipment through this file Right now, I believe that we're really trying to catch up on the facilities needs and the IT needs for the um, um, rest of the county. So I'm not sure why we're trying to double stack this these things. And we already had a plan that was from a much larger plan and study by the county to do to do these things. Why I know elections are important. I don't know that. Um, it's the right time to make these changes um, and add add this to um, the capital needs that we have when we have such a wide range of backlog of capital needs. So um, I don't know that I would support this change. Other discussion? Mike, did you have something? Uh, yeah, um, but it kind of shifted based on what you just said, um, particularly in that Yes, uh, sorry, just like the I know elections important are, are an important thing kind of threw me off. Um, yeah, they are, um, and I believe there's at least uh, a mandate to make sure that we are holding them um, in the most um, fair and unrestricted and um, legitimate way possible. So I, I and, and again, this isn't, we're not putting budgets or accounting figures or anything like that down at this current moment. This is a go forth and hopefully let's see if we can do this piece of paper to my knowledge as well, right? That's what we're talking about. This is us putting it out there. So that's Aaron. Thanks, Jim. Um, speaking to the capital asset replacement fund, the idea of the calculation of the full reserve funding, we've seen numbers in the past, I have. They're probably almost unobtainable. They're, if, if they are obtainable, they're going to be tough to meet. I don't know that we need to need to specifically spell that out. Um, the, the enterprise resource planning stuff. I hope we continue to fund it, but ultimately, to me, that's part of the budgeting process. I would hope we would put priority on these anyway, but that's up to the county board. Speaking to the general fund, that to me, the idea of the necessary equipment and software, I haven't been fully satisfied in my mind that what we have won't work. Put a little bit of money into it. Um, this to me sounds like we're picking and choosing, oh, we want this department to have a little bit of a heads up or a go ahead of, ahead of all the other departments. Well, I work with John Hall at ELUC. He could still use another staff, so maybe we should add a amendment in here that um, we should try and put another staff member for planning and zoning. Um, or uh, who, let's see, or you know, whatever, whatever your particular case may be I don't think we need to particularly call out any one department they can come for the department heads the elected officials they can come forward present it as part of their budget and 
do it the normal way. I don't know that we need to sing, sing, take any one and particularly speak especially for it um, in this, this process. Um, again, I never heard the call that our equipment was going to just fail immediately and we couldn't keep, th keep our elections going. I never heard that previously. It, it, was, it was getting old. It needs replaced. I think I've heard that probably ever since I've been on the board or close to it. It's being replaced slowly. It had been being replaced slowly. But the idea that all of a sudden we just aren't going to be able to have an election, no, I'm not convinced. I haven't been convinced yet. Ha is it gonna, and is it going to be safe or secure? As far as I'm concerned, it will be. Have they not been in the past? What's going to change to not make it safe and secure? I haven't been convinced of this, and the idea that we're going to just signal out any one department, any one elected official, to me, it's it's not called for. So I'll be voting no. Mr. Thorson. Okay, I'm I'm in support of this. Uh, in part, the first four parts, because from what I understand, they were in the document, which is direction from the board to the county executive to create a budget with some guidance from us. One of these has to do, the ERP, this is an outdated equipment that's no longer going to function, function very much longer. Uh, I, I want that in there. Uh, the general fund need, the election need, I think the previous clerk had talked uh, for quite some time that we were at a, a point where uh, an investment in machines that were modern, machines that could be maintained. Some of the machines, a great majority of the machines we have now, are no longer available or able to be maintained. They're using broken machines to fix other machines. Maybe you haven't heard about this, but that, that doesn't make it not a fact. Uh, there's a, a, a cadre of laptops that are running old software. If you have a computer at home, you know that there are certain platforms that are no longer supported. Some of them are not allowed to connect to the web anymore at the University of Illinois uh, because they're too easily accessed. Uh, Microsoft no longer provides updates for security. Uh, this county has systems that use computers that shouldn't be attached to the web. Uh, we have some very good IT people here who've called out some of this. Uh, this document is not uh, concrete. This document isn't line by line budget items, Jim. This is direction. Uh, we're calling out a particular thing that's the fundamental reason why we're here. We're all elected officials. We want those votes counted properly, securely. We want everyone who wants to vote to be able to vote. And we want to make sure that that process, that entire process, happens properly. Uh, I'm happy to drive a 1953 Alice Chalmers down the field because it still works, but my phone is four years old and it's no longer safe. It doesn't work. Uh, we're in a different era. Uh, we, we heard the previous clerk. We know the current clerk is working with a system um, that uh, is not an ideal system. I understand that we need roofs and sidewalks. And I was the zoning board chairman for eight years and on that board for 10, and John has always needed somebody else. The difference is that electronic equipment, and unfortunately we rely too much on it, expires a lot faster than the people in John's office uh, or the equipment at the highway department. Uh, we have to address this new reality, and I want to make sure that this document uh, in particular with the election funding and these other four items, because it's our document to the executive, spells it out clearly. Then we will work through all the different things. We'll have the department heads in in August. Uh, we'll hear what they, they need. They'll have time to look at what it is. But I want to give the executive this direction to make sure that it's heard and understood that this is a need that should be considered. And this is all this document is, is advisory. Other discussion? Mr. McGuire. Um, thank you. Um, it, it's about priorities. I mean, 
there has been discussions about some of the issues with the with the voting equipment. Um, but is it the priority now when we have a whole list of AS400 cloud backup service, antivirus software, security operations center, ERP, all of those things. That's 40 years, 40 year old equipment. And now we're talking about moving that in the back of the line or, or putting that, sidelining some of those items and moving up something all, the, all at once that wasn't the priority that it had been in the past. And while the elections are important, having the, the financial software and the equipment fail at the county because a person has to retire and can't do something, you know, we have to prioritize how we move things forward. And we've been talking about those things for a lot longer and mu much more in depth than we have the voting equipment all of a sudden that we decide we have to replace all of it. When in the past we haven't done it that, in, with that kind of priority. And that's why it's kind of odd that all of a sudden all at once we have to do that. That's why it's not, it doesn't seem as, as important. Mr. Patterson. Uh, I've only been on this county board for two years, but I can say that just about every time the previous county clerk came to us, he mentioned the fact that we, we needed a drastic technology upgrade. Um, and just, just to Stephanie, this is your amendment. Could you speak to, did you have references to cutting, cutting back on other upgrades or pushing them to the end of the line in your motion? No. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. And to, just to one point, um, in, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, I, if you said to me, what is the most important thing in the motion that I made, um, the election, um, language that I put in is very important, but to me the ERP is is important. I work with the financial staff, um, you know, sometimes I call them multiple times um, a week. Um, I think it's unconscionable unconscion that this was taken out. It's a commitment we made to that staff. It's a signal to that staff that who have been struggling to keep things going because somebody is retired for years and we've made that commitment, and there's nothing wrong with saying that we've made that com commitment in a document um, charging our opinion. All this is is our opinion of how the budget um, should, ha should happen. And um, since I'm the deputy finance chair and since the clerk is here, I will say on the record that what I'm proposing is in no way, shape, or form a blank check. It is that this is something that needs to be done. It needs to be not done now. To be clear, this county does not have a technology plan. That is a problem. We should, and it's something that we need to work on so that we have a comprehensive technology plan that is not something that currently exists. But that said, I fully expect that any available funds within the clerk's budget, any automation funds, any way that we could spread the need to, to, to pay for new equipment out over time, and grants that we could go after, all of that should go in to the equation. So I am not putting forward a dollar amount. I'm just saying, uh, look, we know that this need is out there. Um, this is our chance to say what is important to us as a board. We have very few opportunities in the budget process to say um, what is important to us as a board. This is one of them. I put forward a specific proposal on something that I think that we should vote on. Um, I think that it is, a dereliction of our duty not to give more direction. Otherwise, what are we passing here? Just a chart that says, here's some dates, and by the way, I mean, in other words, this is a useless document in some ways. If we're not going to give any opinion, if we're not going to give any feedback, I kind of don't understand the point of, of this exercise. So I put forward a specific proposal uh, based on um, long conversations, and, and that's where it came from. Ms. Eisenman. I'm just curious, you keep saying that it, this, these were in the original language. Who took it out? Um, I'm not sure. It, oh. I guess the executive. It was in the, 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 the four under the capital asset replacement, uh, asset replacement fund were in the draft document that we saw in the finance agenda meeting uh, last Tuesday. And then it, but then they were not in the document that was emailed out. So we don't know why it was taken out. Can we ask? Yeah, it was, I mean, Darlene and I talked, and she said that we're not going to put any priorities in. We're going to go through a full budget process. So, Mr. Harper, you had your hand up. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what to say here. Uh, I've been here six and a half years, and I think every time there's an election, the clerks come, said we need equipment. 
uh, every time he bought what few machines he could buy out of his own uh, the county clerk's budget. I don't doubt that it needs to be updated. Uh, uh, and as Mr. Thorsland, this is a, a wish list, I call it, whatever, Stephanie. But I think when we get done here at the end of August, we're going to find a budget that is completely out of bounds. And I don't know where the cuts are going to come from. The sheriff's sitting back here. We're losing deputies that we can't afford to pay. We just lost one to Gibson City. Gibson City, Rant to a Muhammad, pay more than the county, let alone Champaign or Bannon and U of I. Tell me where the money's coming from, guys. That's all I want to know. I'm not doubting that the clerk needs new equipment. I need a new tractor and a combine, but I can't get it. I just, you know, uh, you know. I think I think uh, Aaron needs to uh, follow up on the uh, uh, grant proposals if they were started. I think we need to research this more. But you know, bring it to the budget, make it a full budget deal. But I don't know where the money's coming from, folks. Mr. Summers. If I heard uh, Finance Chair Goss correctly, he indicated that we would be going through the full budget process. My understanding is that this document is to provide direction to the way that we want that budget to look as a board. So what I'm hearing is we're abrogating board responsibility to provide direction, and we will simply receive a budget without advice of the board. That is not acceptable. Mr. Esri. Individual departments and elected officials present their own budgets without our advice and during the budget hearing process is when we get to say yay, nay, can you change this, can you change that, we accept it as is, we want you to totally redo it. This isn't advocating anything in my mind. Mr. McGuire. Well, I'm, I'm not sure why we don't know some of the things that are supposed to be in the budgets, um, five-year forecast lists, um, many of the things we're talking about. Um, if if you go through the list, um, the DevNet, like I talked about. Oh, DevNet, soft, the Microsoft licensing, AS400, antivirus software, security operations center, camera software costs beginning in 2020. It just goes through this whole list. It's all in the document. I mean, what we're doing here is changing that. We're, we're uh, interceding and, and putting our own list in there of those things that aren't part of what the plan was and what the plan has been since last year for the capital asset fund. Mr. Vachaspati. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just want to add, I encourage everyone to go take a tour of the clerk's office and see the process they use for, uh, you know, doing the elections. Before, before that, I was sort of a, generally aware that the machinery was outdated and, you know, it was difficult to buy and stuff, but I thought, you know, like you guys do, that it's fine and we can sort of keep stumbling along. Um, but, you know, I, I went and took that tour, and it horrified me as much as seeing the downtown jail. So I, I strongly encourage you to do that uh, if you have time. You know, the clerk is very uh, I've been great. through there multiple times. It's not He's not the first clerk that's been there. Well, okay. I, I'm saying I hadn't been on a tour previously, and I was made aware of the actual procedures used for um, for handling the elections, including carrying a computer from one building to another in a car, uh, that if that computer gets dropped, you know, we're in trouble. And um, and so I encourage everyone to take a tour of that uh, facility and of that pr uh, process. Other comments, discussion, Mr. Ingram. Yeah, just uh, speaking to that, I, I had some similar um, revelations in that manner too. I remember the previous clerk talking about certain machines that the judges would have to know they could only be fed one way or, um, you know, one person had to go with certain machines because they knew how to fix that particular machine's particular problems, um, you know, laptops that are um, so, like, horribly outdated that you can barely get them to boot up, um, you know, computers still running Windows XP uh, for anybody that's sitting on a 
Windows 10 machine or even Windows 7 machine right now, XP has been, you know, it's been bricked for a very long time and does not get any support. So um, it was, I had a similar kind of revelation as uh, Mr. Bunch's body in, in that it's, I mean, they've been holding it together with glue and tape for a long time, which is admirable, but I mean, I do think this is something we need to be paying pretty close attention to. Discussion. Okay, it's my turn. I've watched this process. This is supposedly a process. Now, whether you all like it or not, it's the county executive's responsibility to put forth a budget. Yes, we can make suggestions, but you know what? I think District 1 ought to have more, finance, more funding, so I'm going to amend the budget to do that. It's not the way we do it. The way we do it is they bring it through in a process. They bring forth items by each department. Those items are laid out for us line by painstaking line at the end of August. The fact that hardly anybody asked a question last year, not my issue. I mean, that's, that's the fact that nobody wanted to know anything about the budget last year and sat through two nights and asked very few questions. That's, that's beside the point. They need to bring it in a process, just like I, I asked the sheriff who brought, brought forth a proposal. I said, that's not the way you bring it to the, to the table. I, don't, I believe the CARF, because we've already set that forward, I believe that's exactly the right way to do it. However, I, I don't want to step on the clerk's toes. I don't want to step on the sheriff's toes. But you bring it forward in a process. This is not the way to do it and say, well, I want my pet project. I think agriculture should be funded. I think we ought to give the county extension. I want to see in this document the county extension funded by 175% of what it is today. I'm sorry, that's not the way this is done. The way it's done is in a process where the department heads come forward. If this is such a critical thing, and it is critical, I mean, I find it a little bit hypocritical by several on this board who've been on here forever. We've just told Gordy, make it work in your budget. Wasn't a big deal. That's what it was told. Make it work within your budget. Fix the machines you can fix and just make it work because that's what it was told. We don't have money. So this is a process that needs to happen where the department heads bring it forward. It's all put together. It's not prioritized. We will get decision points. You're going to see that the budget's going to be out of balance. It is every single year. You're going to have decision points on how to move forward. But to specify that we're going to, we're going to make sure that we talk to the clerk first, baloney. I will not be supporting this. It's a joke. I like the CARF. If you want to split it out, which you're not going to, but if you want to split it out, that's fine. But there should not be a, a priority for any department head. Not the sheriff, not the circuit clerk, not the county clerk. There should not be one. I mean, we want to complain about some process. We've, we've got software. We just updated software, and we can't get, for the first time in 40 years, we can't get tax bills out on time. So it isn't software that always does it. It's about the people, folks. It's about the people that are the department heads that are supposed to be running the parts of this county. This is a process. The ECE has to bring forward a, a, a budget proposal. She's going to bring a budget. We're going to vote on it just like we always did. I will not be supporting this. Further discussion? I'll split it out. You want to vote on the CARF once and vote on the other one? That's completely fine with me. If I mean, I am very, very, very comfortable um, putting forward a, a, a resolution that says only the recognition of the need to provide necessary equipment and software for an accessible, safe, and secure election in 2020 and letting everybody vote on that. I'd be absolutely comfortable in that. Yeah, so, go ahead. Let's do so that. So if you want to do the car first and then do that second and then Are you going to amend your motion? Yeah, I amend it. I amend that we just do the top half first and then I will uh, propose another. But I have to, whoever my second whoever one has the, Yeah, agree. you have to ask. I think I, I can it? move to divide the amendment. Yeah, I move yeah. to divide it. <laughs> okay. Second, yeah. Mr. Store. All right. So we'll do them separately. Yeah, that's no Somebody problem. else over here had a discussion. Mr. Ingram. 
I just had a question, um, follow up to you. Uh, is is part of the process um, that the county board, as a unit, gets to decide whether or not they want to give uh, to give direction in this? Is that one of the things we can do? Well, that's. I mean, the the point is, this is the county executive who is by statute to prepare a budget. She's telling you, here's the budget process I would like to lay out. We have all kinds of time to make changes because guess what? Every department head is going to come and they're going to say, here's what, here's what I need this year. You know, I got staff that is non-bargaining non unit. I'd like to give them similar money um, that, to what the bargaining unit's going to get. I've got, I've got commodities that, that are still good, but, oh, by the way, my computer's my computers are taking a crap in my automation fund or I don't have an automation fund. They're going to bring that list of priorities to the county executive. They're going to lay it out. And then it's the county executive that's going to put everything. They're going to put everything in a budget. And they're going to bring it in, in the county. We, Stephanie and I ask the opportunity to, for the county, for the department heads to come, say, if they had something that was out of the norm, such as election equipment, they would have an opportunity to speak to the entire county board. Now, for those who haven't been here, it used to be they gave the presentation themselves, and then so you had the opportunity to ask questions. The last couple of years, we've streamlined it, went to a PowerPoint, and really didn't see much of the county. The, the, the elected officials were here, but not maybe as much of the process. So that's just a... Right. I guess my question that I was trying to ask though was, um, is is what we're doing here not part of our ability? I, I'm telling you, as far as I read the statute, it's the, the county executive's responsibility to bring forth the budget. Absolutely, but do we have the ability to make this make this suggestion, make this recommendation? Is this out of bounds? I, I mean, you guys can make whatever recommendation you want. So. Okay. Uh, yes, Ms. Kleppel. I would like to say that I proposed this memorandum to the county board because in previous years, the county board was responsible for directing the county administrator to prepare the budget and gave priorities for that purpose. That's no longer the case. The county executive is not required by statute to come to the county board to determine priorities. So it's think of it more like the governor who prepares the budget and then takes it to the legislature and then the legislature hashes out what they'd like to fund and there probably are changes made to it. Um, this process that you see in front of you that's written here is almost exactly word for word the process that's been used for the last two years. The part that was taken out was negotiated because the uh, vice chair of the finance committee did not want to have any project I said, if we put one project in, we need to take out all the projects. That was the negotiation. So it originally was in the document, in the draft, and because I agreed with her that we did not need to put any special projects in the process itself, I took all of them out. Um, the difference in my mind is that those four projects were established by previous boards. It's not necessary for this board to agree that those will still be priorities. You guys make your own decisions going forward. They were established by previous boards. We're in the process of them, but you don't have to continue them. The other project was a problem for me, and I didn't feel comfortable putting it in because it's a special project. Basically, we selected out which special project we want to do this year. Um, there are other special projects on my table that you may or may not be aware of from other departments, and so I didn't feel it fair to select one and put it there. Um, as I then thought about it, I wrote the memo, the cover memo, which said here are some things I'll think about in the budget, and that is not related to the process itself. The process basically is outlined in law. There has to be legislative hearings. There has to be public hearings. The executive has to produce the budget. The board has to approve a budget by a certain date, so we work backward from that time, trying to make sure everybody has input. Um, the chair and vice chair said that they were concerned that the officials would not have enough time this year, as in previous couple of years, to present their own cases for certain things. And so we agreed to put that into the legislative hearings, that, the, that they would be asked to come and 
um, make case for specific things they wanted to prov provide. So that's the process that's outlined before you. The memo has to do with the process. I didn't want to include any specific projects for that reason. I'm happy to hear concerns that the board has or things the board thinks should be included. We are doing a strategic plan. Most of you have been involved with that. And that is the board's input into what some of those priorities should be. So um, those things will all be considered. I'm going to listen to the department heads. I'm going to listen to the board. I'm also listening to the public about things that they're saying. And so all of those will be pieces of what goes into my thought process in putting together a budget for your consideration. So that's what I'd like to say about the memo. And the memo was just basically to show that I'm willing to cooperate with the board in the board's process that the board has set up in previous years. It's just a little bit different this year in terms of um, how the priorities get set. So I just wanted to be able to say that tonight. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. We're going to split these out. Do you have a preference of which one we vote on for? Okay, so we will be voting on the amendment to add the CARF language, um, the Capital Asset Replacement Fund language. So, uh, Mr. Do for roll call. Yes, uh, is there a second for roll call? Okay. Yeah. I won't do the punctuation. Uh, capital Asset Replacement Fund. This is going right under the pr property tax levy, so just so you know where it is on page 22. Uh, capital asset replacement programs have an impact on the general fund and public safety sales tax fund in pro uh, progress commitments for inclusion in the 20 F fiscal year 2020 CARF budget, colon, sorry about that. F uh, one, funding for maintenance scheduled in uh, fiscal year 2020 per the county's facilities capital plan, and funding, uh, two, funding for enterprise resource planning ERP to replace the county's in-house financial system, and three, funding for other CARF equipment and items previously scheduled for replacement in 2020, and four, an estimated calculation of full reserve funding required for future CARF replacement schedules. Okay, has everybody satisfied with that? Okay, roll call. Esri? No. Fortado? Harper? Yes. Ingram? Yes. King Taylor? Yes. McGuire? No. Patterson? Yes. Rector? No. Rosales? Yes. Store? Yes. Summers? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thorsland? Yes. Tinsley? Yes. Vashaspati? Yes. Wolken? Yes. Clemens? Yes. Clifford? Yes. Coert? Eisenman? Yes. Goss? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, the second one. Stephanie, could you reread the second one? Sure. So the new, uh, I'll just read the whole thing just so it's clear. The new general corporate fund will say total fiscal year 2020 non personal expenditures will be held flat against the original fiscal year 2019 budget for non-personnel expenditures with the exception of allowable increases based on com competitively bid contracts or documented cost increases, comma, and the recognition of the need to provide the necessary equipment and software for an accessible, safe, and secure election in 2020. Do we want roll call for this as well? Yes. I do. Mr. Vachaspati, Mr. Okay, roll call. Esri? No. Fortado? Yes. Harper? No. Ingram? Yes. King Taylor? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Rector? No. Rosales? Yes. Store? Yes. Summers? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thorsland? Yes. Tinsley? Yes. Vashaspati? Yes. Wolken? No. Clemens? No. Clifford? No. Coert? Yes. Eisenman? No. Goss? No. Motion passes. Yes.
Yeah, that's, that's just the, that's the amendment. Yeah, so I'm not sure then how so, do we vote on the whole, do we yeah, vote on we, the rest of it? Now we need to, now we technically need to go back and vote on the entire thing as amended because it's such a differing motion. So it's, we need to vote on the entire process as amended. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess splitting it didn't really. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if one of them hadn't passed, then you still would have done it. So. Uh, I need I need a motion because we do not have a mo. Do we have a motion on that, Kay? Moved and seconded. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you want a roll call? Okay. Roll call. Esri. Yes. Fortado. Yes. Harper. No. Ingram? Yes. King Taylor? Yes. McGuire? Patterson? Yes. Rector? No. Rosales? Yes. Store? Yes. Summers? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Thorsland? Yes. Tinsley? Yes. Asaspati? Yes. Wolken? No. Clemens? No. Clifford? No. Cohort? Isenman? No. Goss? No. Motion passes. Okay, now we're down to item 6D. Um, Ms. Ogden, do you want to come up and present? This is the first uh, monthly budget projection report that you have received for fiscal year 2019. Starting on the first page for revenues, um, the projected negative budget variance under the property tax line is associated with preparing the levy to capture new growth revenue in the event of a favorable ruling in the hospital property tax exemption case. Um, we have received our extension letters from the county clerk's office and I don't want to go into a lot of discussion um, right now, but um, in either June or July, I will be coming to you with a budget amendment request to remove additional revenue from the budget associated with, um, you know, a ruling not yet occurring as we have in the past two years. Um, a hotel motel tax, I know this is a, a, you know, small variance in the scope of the entire budget, but I did want to point out that year-to-date revenues so far um, reflect significant increases over the prior year-to-date revenue. This is uh, only for one establishment, the Motel 6, and I don't really have um, an explanation for that, but, yeah, <laughs> funny. But um, we'll take it. Non-business licenses and permits uh, under the licenses and permits section is a projected um, negative budget variance of a little over $200,000. This category is predominantly um, the receipt of revenues for revenue stamps. And um, based on year-to-date performance so far, it appears that this um, revenue line is overstated. We've talked about this uh, quite often in regards to the correlation um, between a revenue and the expenditure. And so um, if we do end up receiving less revenues, we turn around and distribute two thirds of those um, revenues to the state. So you will also see on the expenditure page an adjustment for um, a reduction in expenditures that is reflected as well. It's still fairly early in the fiscal year, so there could be um, improvement in this projection as the year progresses. Oh, one other thing um, that I want to point out is there is also the potential um, for additional revenue in this line um, related to the solar farm uh, zoning permit for the Sydney solar farm. And per Mr. Hall, that's about $193,000. However, at this time, it's not certain whether the county will receive that revenue in fiscal year 2019 or 2020, so it is not reflected in this projection. 
Under state shared revenue, corporate personal property replacement tax, um, we talked last month at length about um, the decline in that revenue um, because of the state's continued diversion of those funds prior to uh, the application of the formula for distribution. However, um, we did receive our um, April uh, revenues and there is a significant one-time boost in April um, that was, you know, has added uh, a significant impact to um, projections for budgeted revenue. And that is related to the um, uh, receipt of corporate tax revenues because of the tax law changes. So you may have read in the News Gazette about the state getting this windfall of um, money. And that is uh, the result of the one-time uh, receipt of revenues in April for uh, greater than expected income and corporate taxes. However, the one cent and the quarter cent projections are um, underperforming year to date. Uh, the uh, one cent is 3.6% less than the revenues received for the same period a year ago. And the quarter cent is 3.8% less than the same period in last fiscal year. So you can see these um, negative projections at this point. Again, still early in the fiscal year. So um, there is the potential for these uh, revenue sources to increase performance and hopefully result in um, better projections as we move in closer into the um, new fiscal year. Use tax budget variance um, is a positive projection of $111,000. And um, a significant portion of this is related to the Wayfair ruling, which the county um, did not include in its 2019 budget. We were uncertain as to what the impact of the Wayfair ruling was going to be, so we did not include additional revenue. And uh, so again, a large um, portion of this additional 111,000 that's projected is related to that. Under fees, fines, and forfeitures, I have um, noted here that the impact of the legislation that Ms. Blakeman discussed earlier is not folded um, into this projection. Um, that legislation, again, uh, will be effective July 1st. It's uncertain um, at the time that I prepared this report exactly what the county board's direction would be. As Ms. Blakeman mentioned, it's also uncertain as to what the impact of the fee and fine waivers was going to be as well. So for the general corporate fees, the um, negative $338,000 budget variance is predominantly actually fully related to preparing the 2019 budget for um, funds that are owed from the nursing home to general corporate fund departments for services that have been provided. So initially, um, we had uh, hoped that the general fund would be able to departments would be able to be made whole through the sale proceeds, but now the prioritization for the sale proceeds is going to have to be um, repayment of the promissory note. So that will take priority, so that's why I'm reflecting um, that we will not be receiving those revenues from the nursing home fund. Under interfund, interdepartment category, the interfund transfer line, the increase um, in the budget of 1.85 million reflects the transfer in from the nursing home fund for the redemption of the 2015 bonds. So those were the bonds that were budgeted in the general corporate fund. And that was completed at the end of April. The next line, the nursing home reimbursement plus interest is um, an anticipation of the nursing home fund paying back the general fund for the transfer that was made at the end of fiscal year 2018 in order to pay the outstanding accounts payable. And then other financing sources um, at the, the last line in this report, 1.98 million, is um, recording the receipt of uh, promissory note proceeds that the um, county got when we issued the loan for the promissory note. Other questions on the revenues before I move to the expenditures? Okay, on the um, expenditure projection report, um, there is a significant um, expectation that there will be underspending 
in personnel predominantly related to underutilization of the county's health insurance um, program. We talked about this uh, when I gave the financial forecast. Um, there were fee waivers, um, not fee waivers, <laughs> there were um, waivers in 2018 and um, at that time it wasn't certain um, whether, you know, after the new plan had been in place that those waivers would continue at that level. There was actually a slight increase in the number of waivers. So um, this is the projection at this time uh, for savings in that uh, expenditure line. There's also at this time um, minimal projections for savings in commodities and services lines. Um, again, it's still ur early in the budget process, so these numbers will fluctuate um, as we move throughout the year. Under debt repayment, bond and debt certificate payments, um, there was an increase in the budget of $1.545 million that was associated with the um, redemption of the 2015 bonds. We already had budgeted for the debt service payment in fiscal year 2019, so this is just the additional amount that was necessary on top of what was already budgeted for the actual redemption of the 2015 bonds. And then also um, the promissory note repayment with interest, which um, the county is expecting to um, be able to pay that note off in this fiscal year. On the summary page, you can see that the county ended fiscal year 2018 with a fund balance of 3.2 million. That significant decline in our fund balance was related to the transfer of almost $2 million to the nursing home to pay its outstanding accounts payable. Um, revenue and expenditure um, difference projection at this point is $2.9 million, and I've broken that down at the bottom so that you can see um, what portion of this is expected from uh, budget surplus and what portion of this is um, from the reimbursement of the nursing home to the general fund for uh, the transfer that was made, in essence, to restore our fund balance to um, what it would normally have been at. So projected underspending at this point is $940,000, and um, the uh, $2 million also uh, related to repayment from the nursing home for the promissory note. I want to just say for the third time, I think, that it is still early in, um, you know, the fiscal year. So, you know, these lines are going to be moving throughout uh, the year. But the projection it, as of today is a little under $6.2 million for um, our fund balance, which translates to a 15% fund balance. The um, target for the general fund is 16.7%. So, we are not yet to that target. And um, I will also say that the county uh, does have a call with Moody's on Friday, which is our bond rating agency. So, um, you know, we have been putting together a substantial amount of information and documentation for them. And um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to um, retain our bond rating. And once we receive that, I'll make sure that we bring that forward. Any questions? Um, those six million includes the two million dollars from the promissory note. How does that it, work? It includes repayment um, from the nursing home for the transfer that was made at the end of 2018. The promissory note itself is really a balance sheet transaction. I mean, you know, we receive the revenue and we from the bank and we've budgeted to repay the note. What really, you know, restores the fund balance is the nursing home um, transferring the $2 million back to the general fund prior to the end of the fiscal year, in essence, allowing us to repay the promissory note. So if we repaid it, $2 million, and then we still are owed a $1 million from, so we're like $3 million, so we're really at $3 million. The $3 million loan is still outstanding, and there is not an anticipation, I'm sorry, the $1 million loan is still outstanding. There's not an anticipation that that will be able to be paid back in this fiscal year. But if we did, where, what percentage would the reserve be without that $3 million? 
Well, we aren't going. We aren't projecting the one million would be paid back. So, are you asking if the two million is not paid back, what the projected fund balance would be? Yeah. So, that's what I'd like to know. You know, because obviously, we're kind of loaning ourselves money to make our debt look better because we owe this money million dollars to somebody. We got the other two million. So, if I did the math, I guess three million would it make it seven million? Actually, would be the reserve right now. Yes, if the nursing home were able to pay back the million dollar loan. Yes, you would just add another million to our fund balance. Right. This kind of shows where we're really at. We're kind of one of our requirements of our budget is we don't use money for operation, loan money for operations and it's not a successful Jim, let me correct that. That that um, million dollars was actually a loan, not a transfer. So no, um, it's reflected on the balance sheet as a loan. So it would not add an additional million dollars to our fund balance. I th yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking clearly. Right. Because of course, the, if we the $2 million dollars was a transfer, which had an impact on the fund balance. The million dollars is actually a loan. Right. If we wouldn't have spent the million dollars, this is probably towards you. We wouldn't have spent the million dollars carrying the nursing home as long as we had, or spent the other two million dollars. We wouldn't be three million dollars in the hole, spending money we didn't have to support the nursing home. Other questions, comments for Ms. Ogden, uh, Stephanie. When do you anticipate us taking the vote for the two million dollar transfer? Are you Are you asking when the anticipation is that it would be? Well, it doesn't require a vote, um, but um, at this point, with the public aid pending. I'm still in flux. Uh, we just need to wait and see how quickly we can, you know, remedy that before we would pay this back. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Tammy. Any other business to bring before the Finance Committee? Uh, chair's report, I have a slight one that's mostly commentary. Um, as a chair of, of the Finance Committee, I'm beyond irritated with the constant fact that we still have elected officials who are paid more than $90,000 a year that refuse to show up to our county board meetings. Now, I've asked our treasurer multiple times, half a dozen times, to bring forward a cash, cash flow projection which she supposedly says is her expertise, yet we have not seen one single cash flow expertise, cash flow report. There's not one. She refuses to put that together. I don't know if it's incompetence or just her re standard refusal. You know, I, I don't understand why this, the Finance Committee, has not been informed when the tax bills are going to go out. It's ridiculous that we had this tax bill conversion. Had the election went the other way, I'm sure you'd all been screaming why the tax bills didn't go out for the first time in at least 40 years the first week of May. You wouldn't give, you wouldn't give a break because it's new software. Oh, by the way, that software is used in 80 of 102 counties, I believe. So it's not, this is not rocket science. This is not we've got a different pro product than everybody else. Maybe if our county clerk spent more time getting the tax extensions correct, instead of out lobbying you all for a million bucks for election equipment, maybe they'd be in the mail. I've warned as many public officials as would listen that they needed to check their, their tax extensions. I have fear that there are, there are actually taxing bodies, especially townships that don't have the expertise. They're going to get their tax extensions. They're going to be wrong, and guess what? They've signed off on them. They're going to be short money. No way to recover it. That's, I guess that's their fault, but in the past, they all, we always had somebody that was taking care of them. You know, there's many board members on this that have been on here since, since uh, we started working on this nursing home, and they're now rallying behind. Well, what, they watched us lose millions of dollars by holding off on a vote on a nursing home, and now we're rallying behind the county clerk to go blow a million dollars on election 
equipment. Elections are changing. We see that every time that they report. Every time that we report something, there's more and more percentages of them. People are voting by mail, number one, because it's a whole bunch more convenient. So you can do it in the leisure of your home. You can sit there, study. I can sit there with my computer and, and look at the different candidates if I choose to do that. I mean, elections are changing. I don't know why we're talking about a million dollars worth of equipment at this point already. So on a final note, the budget process was just a process. That's all it was. The fact that we monkeyed around with this and we started throwing in pet projects was beyond ridiculous. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you for your comments, Jim, <clears throat> and for your thorough uh, report. Uh, De designation of items for consent. Sorry, designation of items. Sorry, uh, that's uh, number 7A, 2A, 4B, and 6A. 6A was the resolution adopting the financial policies. Was that not a... I think that was... It was not the unanimous. Okay. All right. I had it down as unanimous. So was it? Yeah, okay. I believe that one was unanimous. It's not the next one. Could you repeat those? Could you repeat yes, those Yes, I will Jim? repeat them. It's A2A, A4B, and A6A. Great. Yeah, but I, there's no... There's, there's not there's nothing to consent agenda for that. If there's no ordinance, it's just a vote to to move her forward. So there's nothing for consent agenda. Thank you for that uh, report, uh, Jim Goss, and thank you for keeping us on point, uh, Aaron Esri, uh, for that clarity that we had not finished that portion of the agenda. Uh, Kyle Patterson, can you do uh, justice and social services? Thank you. Um, our first item is the reentry program quarterly report. We have Misty uh, as the coordinator of the program. Do you want to give us a quick update on what's going on? Okay, um, I'll be brief. <laughs> 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 um, um, as you know, Rosecrans um, offers several um, um, programs um, that um, focus on reentry. Um, one is our criminal justice program. Um, another one is um, the Champaign County Reentry Program, um, and another one is the CU Fresh Start Program. So they ha um, provide some aspect of reentry services, um, and so um, I've been um, excited to begin um, extensive collaboration with both um, programs internally, since they are Rosecrans um, internal programs. Um, so that we can um, enhance the Champaign County Reentry Program and we can work together as a team. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, and so I've made some extensive um, program changes to the reentry program within the last quarter um, based upon my findings, my data analysis, and things like that. Um, um, within my job responsibility, I am the program coordinator of the reentry program as well as the case manager, um, as well as the data analysis. Um, and I also um, run the administrative aspect of the reentry council. Um, I'm excited to say that um, on an average uh, with the reentry council, we're um, having about 25 members um, on a monthly basis, which is a, a drastic increase. Um, so we have existing members that have joined um, and new members that have joined um, to come to the table to share resources. And that's the main purpose of the reentry council. And then also to share the data from um, the program itself um, from the Champaign County Reentry Program so that they can see um, that they are making an impact um, and their expertise um, at the table um, is, is duly um, noted and taken advantage of. So I just want to go um, over um, a couple of things. Um, one of the things is with the Reentry Council, we've allowed a lot of um, programs to come and present so that um, we can leverage resources. So. Um, Joe Trotter from um, um, Narcan came um, and presented. We had TAS come um, this coming up month. We had the Salvation Army come. Um, we're working um, currently um, with um, Captain Vogus to hopefully get the um, county jail 
um, to come and present with all of the new services that they're providing to inmates and things like that. So we're doing a, 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 a huge program presentation every month um, to share with the council to hopefully leverage those resources every single month. So that's um, been very exciting. Um, also too, um, as I stated, I've been doing some extensive collaboration, primarily at this point with the criminal justice program. Um, within the county jail. So as you know, um, they're funded by the mental health program, um, mental health board, um, and primarily um, offers programs for individuals with um, behavioral health needs. Um, and so based upon the data within the past um, quarter, I noticed that there was a huge gap. Um, the reentry program, um, since the changes of the program um, and everybody kind of split, we primarily were receiving referrals from the Department of Corrections. Um, and there was an entire population within the county jail that was being untouched um, besides what the, sh the criminal justice program were doing. Um, the way it basically works is individuals are screened within the jail um, and out of that pool of individuals that screen, they do a, a, almost like a, a secondary um, check to see out of those screenings who are truly positives. Um, and out of those positives, they offer services for individuals that have specific behavioral health needs. But then all of the individuals that were not a true positive, they were not even being touched. And so that's one of the things that I've done is work with the criminal justice program within Rosecrans to identify all of those individuals that scored either a negative or didn't score anything um, or weren't even screened within the jail system um, and um, make contact with them upon um, um, being released, um, particularly if they've been sentenced. Um, and also, um, I've been working with the county jail as well to begin to start making our presence known at the county jail um, so that I can meet, begin meeting with inmates um, upon their, um, prior to their release, as well as touching base with them after they're released um, so that we can um, hopefully get a, a more universal um, um, snapshot um, of how we're making an impact in Champaign County. So I'm excited about that. Um, and that's one of the, um, the major changes that we've made within the third quarter. Um, unfortunately, the data that I did present to you from our mid-year quarter did not entail any Champaign County data. Um, so hopefully um, beginning of April of 2019, I will be able to retroactively go back from the beginning of this year and begin to start tracking that data for you. Um, and hopefully we can see, like I said, an, a universal overall snapshot of not just um, individuals that are released from incarceration into Champaign County from IDOC, but as well as the county jail. Um, so just to give you um, some numbers, because I don't want to be here long sometimes, <laughs> um, I was able to retroactively go back since the beginning of the year from the county jail, 70, 47 individuals were on the sentencing report. 12 of those individuals scored positive, 13 of those scored negative, and I was able to reach out um, to those um, 35 individuals. Um, and out of those 35 individuals, I believe um, up to this date, we have at least between like five to six individuals that have taken me up on reentry services. Um, and like I said, it's still um, individuals are coming in, but I'm able to um, establish a process very similar to how I do IDOs, I, the Department of Corrections, um, in tandem with the county jail. So um, currently right now for the third quarter, um, this is just IDOC parolees. We have 20. Out of those 20, I was able to engage 13 individuals in reentry services. And if you can see just for the third quarter for 2019, the biggest need for identified needs currently right now is benefits. Um, that is a huge need, um, and the process in order to even get a state ID has drastically changed. So um, a lot of my, the resources um, and legwork goes into really, as soon as they come out within that first week, getting them established with a social security card, birth certificate, um, you know, and proof of residency so that they can get their, 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 their form of ID so that they can start some type of employment. Um, and so um, you can see for the year, the cumulative year, um, that the top one, um, I believe, is um, between um, behavioral health needs. But that's when both programs were combined. Now that we've separated them out, 
um, and individuals that don't necessarily have behavioral health needs, the biggest issue right now is benefits, you know, receiving food stamps, uh, receiving, um, you know, um, assistance with navigating through the DMV, navigating through the Social Security office, navigating through the county office trying to get a birth certificate. And I'll have to say this, that um, a lot of these entities have been very, very, very supportive um, since I've taken on this position, just being able to come in with a client that's just been released within the net last couple of days and get a free birth certificate says a lot. And every county doesn't do that. I'm struggling right now with Cook County. I'm struggling right now with Pulaski County in Missouri. Like they don't do things like that. Um, and they don't offer a lot of reentry services for individuals that's been released. So as we know, these individuals don't have funds to do this. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm scraping up money trying to get them. Um, and we partner with like the Central Illinois um, 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 Foundation to even help us with bus pass, you know, um, funds for transportation and things like that. So I just have to say that, you know, Champaign County, we do have a, a lot of individuals that sit at the table and really contribute and really help us with reentry services. Um, so, and lastly, one of the things I um, want to highlight is the recidivism data. So out of the recidivism data, uh, we have a, approximately about 13 individuals at this point um, that have been engaged for the third quarter. Um, out of those third quarter, no one has recidivated just yet, but the pending um, judgments did go up to six. I think it was five the last time I met you, so it's two more additional ones. And so we have six pending right now, and I'm waiting for the outcomes of that. As you know, all pending charges doesn't necessarily result in the conviction, so I have to wait to those individuals, that case is closed, and see whether it, they've been sentenced again um, or it's been dismissed to determine their recidivism. Um, and so hopefully the next time I come before you with the next county report, I'll hopefully be able to include the Champaign County jail data within that recidivism data as well too. Um, and I did that because I wanted to address one of the questions from the last time I was here um, with the engaged versus the non-engaged recidivism rates and how the variance was very minimal. Um, so I'm hoping to see a, a vast um, jump from that um, since we've incorporated the Champaign County data, data, jail data within this. So um, I was not able or I decided not to include the non-engagement because of that. So hopefully the next time I come before you, we'll be able to see the engaged versus the non-engaged and see the comparison of data then. So that's the conclusion. Um, I don't want to be before you too long. So. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I just had a quick, um, when you're referring to people from the county jail, are those people who serve their sentence in the county jail or are those people who are waiting? So currently trial? right now what I do is I get a, a weekly um, uh, report for individuals that have been sentenced. Okay. Yeah. And so, that. and they're still there. They just haven't been released yet. So they're serving their sentence. And so what I've done now is I've been cleared and able to be present within the county jail to go in and meet with them before they're released as well as get access to their information and send them follow-up afterwards after they're released. Um, it was, you talk about negative score. What do you mean by negative? Do you mean that it, it didn't? I just put negative as a, uh, you know, a inverse kind of, of positive. So <laughs> it's just that they didn't score any. They, it's it was kind of positive, yes. but it's negative. So they, they didn't register. They like didn't register, mental basically. Health or behavioral health. Exactly. So, so basically what you're saying is that the people who just weren't registering for any behavioral health or mental health needs, you still have been reaching out to them to see what kind of needs outside of mental health. Exactly. Health. Okay. Yes. Um, and then, unfortunately, sometimes based upon their parole stipulation, they are required to get an assessment, but that doesn't mean that they meet the need of a behavioral health need. So I'm able to at least touch base with them once they're, they come out and get that assessment done. Yeah. Thanks. All right, um, if nobody else has any questions, uh, Chris. Is there any particular reason why some of these folks who might benefit from behavioral health modification, mental health, have refused to participate? Do they give any ex any any reason? Um, 
I, I, that, that, that's a toughie, I know. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not within, you know, the criminal justice program and in, but I know that there, um, a lot of times, um, the way it works is once they're screened, even if a question is left blank, it's a positive until they look at it to determine if it's a true positive. Um, and so out of maybe 150 screenings that they've actually done, maybe 20 of those are actually true positives where they meet a behavioral health need. And so um, out of that remaining 140 or 100 and, you know, um, 30, um, I look at those individuals that are sentenced um, and then um, reach out to them. And then the ones that aren't sentenced, I still, I'm hoping for the next quarter, provide just information for those um, and resource, because as you know, we have a Champaign County reentry guide and manual that links individuals that have been um, recently um, released with health healthcare resources within the community. They've partnered with, you know, the University of Illinois. They have a, a, a their, their reentry manual as well too, and I'll hopefully to provide that information for them upon their, you know, reentry into society. But a lot of times, a lot of them don't need the resource that they would need if they serve a sentence. So. Else? Yeah, um, th by the way, thanks for, um, you know, promising to bring up that new data because that's something I had questions about last time. I, I just want to clarify, uh, you know, the drop in contacts from 167 in 2017 to 57 in 2018, uh, that's due to you not getting uh, information from IDOC? Exactly. Okay. Yes. And you're not getting that information? Yes, I okay. am. And so do you have sort of a projection of how many contacts and screenings you might do this year? Um, honestly, um, or if that's hard to judge, I mean, I know it well, varies throughout the year. I can make a prediction yeah. based upon 2018, just sure. because the program changed the beginning of 2018. Okay. So if you look at maybe January 18 to December 18, the average of parolees was 43. Right. Um, and you so already have gotten 20. So. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, next on the agenda, we have monthly reports. Animal Control Emergency Management Agency, Head Start, Public Defender, Probation and Court Services, uh, Veterans Assistance Commission. Um, those are all available on the website. Uh, next on the agenda, we have a uh, actionable item, uh, Emergency Management Agency, request for approval of the application for renewal and, if awarded, acceptance of the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Hazardous Materials Emergency Preparedness Grant. October 1st, 2019 through September 20th, 2022. Do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Ingram, second. Uh, Mr. Picado, uh, is there any discussion? I know we have the sheriff here. Did he want to comment on this? It's kind of late. No. Oh. Uh, enth enthusiastic no. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, um, that is it, no other business. For chair's report, just a couple announcements. There's going to be a uh, the police memorial ceremony at the courthouse uh, this Friday the 17th at noon. Uh, where exactly at the courthouse is that gonna be at? At noon. Another announcement is the uh, courthouse has launched the Sixth Circuit Self-Represented Litigation Help Desk. It is the Ask a Lawyer Desk. Um, looks like it's uh, twice a month for a two-hour period for people who are self-representing themselves in cases and are below 200% of the federal poverty line. Uh, I think this is a great resource for the community, and I um, just want to announce that. The next dates are going to be May 21st. <laughs> June 4th and June 18th. And that is all I got. Thank, Thank you very much, Kyle, for your report. <coughs> well, that was a designation of items to be on the consent agenda. Uh, the uh, 
3A. Thank you once again for keeping us on track, uh, Ms. King. So, moving forward. Uh, Vice Chair uh, John Brexit, could you do policy personnel and appointments? Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, under new business, county executives appointments. Seeking a motion, a board of review, board of review appointment. One position term is six one twenty nineteen through five thirty one twenty two twenty twenty two, and the county executive is uh, suggesting appointment of Paul Saylor. Mr. Esri. Mr. McGuire is second. Any discussion? Yeah. Dr. Young had requested the opportunity for the policy personnel and appointment chairman and vice chair to view applications ahead of receiving a board packet. Personally, I view that as a reasonable request. Um, that was summarily rejected by the county <coughs> executive. Accordingly, I, I will be voting no on some of these appointments. Mr. Thorsland. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think that most of these only had one applicant, uh, but in the past, uh, we were given the opportunity, if there was multiple applicants, to see in the package everybody's form that they fill out to come in. And I'm not sure, uh, because that doesn't happen anymore, I'm not sure if these are the only applicants or not. Uh, and in addition to allowing the chair and vice chair to maybe sit in on some of these interviews, I would like to, when there's multiple applicants, have in the packet the information of the people so that we can sort of look at what was submitted and we know why the choice was made. This is uh, used to be practiced when the chair was making these appointments so we could see it. Uh, because a lot of these, I understand these are very good citizens who step forward to do jobs that people don't particularly even though happen in a county. Uh, but I want to make sure that we as a board uh, get all the information that the executive got so we understand the executive's decision. And because of that, I think some of these as a point, uh, I will also be voting no on. Mr. Ingram? Uh, I would like to echo that. Um, it would be great to have any um, additional applicants uh, in the packet as well. I think, uh, I think that'd be really helpful for us, especially um, I think we probably all, if you check your email, are getting the um, announcements of these and hopefully sending them to people that you know could potentially apply. Um, so it would be, you know, as, as we're all trying to uh, make sure that we have people to actually fill these, it would be good to know if we're getting multiple applicants or any, any information like that. So I'd echo that. Hit me or something. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know sort of I, I agree with the points that my colleagues have been making. In addition, uh, I know in the past there were some questions about changes to the practices of the Board of Review in terms of the standard of evidence they require for um, they require for um, property tax uh, assessment appeals. And I uh, sort of didn't see anything about that in the packet um, in the, you know, in this response, and I'm curious as to if that was brought up during the interview. It's easy to see across. I can't see right next to me. Mr. McGuire. If I had the opportunity, I'd hit you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So obviously we have a question about whether the county executive has a right to pick the nominations for the positions. Um, which was also the rule and um, whether they have the right to see the applications and maybe the applications don't fit the proper position. Um, I would ask the county executive um, what the process is first and I'd follow up. Thank you. I appreciate being asked. All of the applications are always in your packet. We are usually only have as many applicants as we have vacancies, and I think I've mentioned that several times at the board meeting before. I give, I'm giving you all of the applications in the packet. Secondly, if we decide not to pass these applicants, 
I don't know the schedules of their next meetings, but it's very likely there are only a few people on each of these boards, and the, the business like we have to have business, we may short the number of people to be able to appropriately perform their duties, and uh, they may not be able to complete their work. And some of these committees only meet every three months. So hopefully we won't continue to do this to get an option that we don't really have or a responsibility we don't really have. Stephanie? Um, I'll also be voting no on some of these. And uh, just for me, um, I don't think this changes at all that the executive gets to make these appointments. I think the ask to be able to sit in on the interviews is important. I think we have a policy and personnel committee. And I think Mr. Rector and Dr. Young should have the opportunity to meet some of these folks and maybe find out a little bit about them and find out a little bit about what all these different boards do so that we are actually participating in the process. It doesn't take away. The decision is the executive, but we have, uh, we confirm the decisions. And if, and if we're not, um, if we don't think that the process to coming to these decisions, even if it's only one person, it's also just a chance to understand the the government and and the, the positions that they're that they're um, that they're filling. Um, I don't really know. I mean, these two folks are, you know, the chair and the vice chair of the policy and personnel committee. I think it's a good idea for them to have a chance to talk to folks and find out, hey, what it is you do, what is what are your credentials, so that they could go out and maybe in the future we'll have two people apply because they'll be better informed in order to get more applications. Uh, so I, I am also going to be voting no. Uh, on some of these appointments. Mr. Esri. Thank you. If anyone cares to find out what these other governmental bodies do, go to their meetings. They're open meetings act. They're under them. My dad's on a drainage district board. He had to take the training for the open meetings act. That'd be the absolute best way to find out what they do. Go to their meetings. The idea that you're going to sit there and find out what they actually do, can you sit down and tell everybody what we do if you were to sit down and talk to them one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, that would, I, you, I suppose you can. How long would it be? Some of these are pretty detailed as well. Even though they're small boards, they're pretty well detailed. So the idea that you're going to sit down and talk to them and learn what those governmental bodies do a water district board. The main thing is it provides the water for the people in that district. They tax. They provide the infrastructure. I mean, it, it's some of it's kind of basic. There's the intimate details. If you want to find out, the, the place to go would be going, and like a Sang a water Sangman Valley Water District, I know, which is on here, it, it, as far as a letter of resignation. They have a have people that work there. Um, a regular weekly job. Go and ask them. They'd be open, I'm sure. You might have to set up an appointment just because they wouldn't necessarily want to be caught out of the blue by people just walking in saying, oh, hey, what do you do? Can you sit down and talk to me? No, but they'd be open to talk to you. I have no doubt. So the idea to me, again, there are oftentimes very few people willing to apply for, the, for these jobs, in large part because they kind of run un, unseen. It'd be nice if maybe no, more people did know about them, but that's, people have to want to know about them, these jobs. You can't necessarily legislate or make people want to know about these and want that make people apply for these positions. So if there's only one person who applies, what's, again, if, if they're doing a bad job, if they're, if they're a incumbent, if they're doing a bad job, or if they're not an incumbent, but they're the only one for an unfilled seat, the people in that area usually know the word will get out. The word, word will get back to either the county executive or the people in that board district, us, that, hey, this person should not be put on there. Otherwise, it's kind of a, okay, the people in that district obviously haven't had a big issue with them, so they're 
not complaining. Like, this, again, the Sanguine Valley Water District, if somebody on that board was doing a bad job and it was one person, I can just about guarantee that the people who were served by the Sanguine Valley Water District would know about it and they would be up in arms somewhat and telling especially Mr. Goss and Ms. Eisenman that, hey, this person, you're our county board person, and since you guys appoint him, this person, if he's up for re um, reappointment, maybe we can't kick him off or it's not worth trying to kick him him or her off like right now but don't don't reappoint them we need to find someone else because they're not doing the job so the idea that we're going to potentially again like was mentioned short change some of these boards by not filling them and po potentially keeping them from doing their work to me is unconscionable Um, I would just hate for one of my constituents to come to me and tell me about uh, somebody who's been appointed, and I, I can't even tell them I've even met them. You know, don't know what they look like or anything like that. So, like, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry about Ms. Goss and uh, Ms. Eisman, but yeah, I would like to sit in on interviews and uh, talk and have positions. And if I would hate for one of my constituents to call me complaining about somebody, and I have nothing more than a little information that was given to me. I haven't even like spoke to the person. So, Jody, at Jody first, Frangel, you're next. I understand the frustration that um, some of you feel that you have not met the people that are are here, but let, let's not exasperate the problem and not vote these people in just because you're upset about the process. It's it's not these people that are being voted in, it's not their fault. And they are, as Aaron mentioned, it's hard to get people in these positions. We don't vote them in tonight. They may just say, fine, they don't want me in here, I'm not going to do it. And then where are we at? Pranjal. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate that for this position in particular, you know, we have had people come and speak before us uh, about problems at the Board of Review. Um, so this isn't something where, you know, we haven't heard nothing from no one. We have heard something from, from some people about the Board of Review and, uh, you know, problems there. And that hasn't been addressed here. I don't know if it was addressed in the interview. Um, there's obviously no one on the board who can speak as to whether it was addressed on the interview. So, um, you know, it's not nothing from no one. It's something from some. Hi, Jody. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to say, I don't know what ones you're voting for or not, but in Penfield, their population is 193. So um, the fact that there's two applicants for this, I'm thinking probably should push it through because there's not a lot of other people to pull from there in Penfield. Is all I'm gonna, that's the only one I can comment on. Mr. Osri? Thanks. Um, I guess I would ask um, Darlene, especially to say the Board of Review. I forget, are, are there requirements? That, what are some of the specific requirements to be on the Board of Review? Each of the positions that when they're listed, the job opening is posted. They do have specific requirements for several of the boards. There's also a specific combination of people that's required on some of the boards. So for example, there has to always be um, a doctor, there has to always be in, you know, different kinds of professions, those kind of things. They also have to be geographically spread out. So in certain cases, they have to represent different villages or different areas of the district. Um, and for some of these, like Board of Review and other ones like that, there are specific certification requirements for professions that have to be represented. So I, my point is that further limits our pool of applicants. Mr. Patterson. Uh, I guess I just want to make the point that um, the issue that Steve originally raised is not an issue of necessarily uh, not having enough applicants or whether or not there should be a review of uh, a position where there's one applicant. We had, uh, I think it was last year, a DBA appointment that 
we had three spots, three applicants, and Pius told one of the applicants because it was a problematic individual. So the idea that if there's no, if there's only one applicant, that it's a cut and dry, there's nothing to look at there. I just, I mean, in recent history, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, the executive has a statutory uh, responsibility to appoint people. We have the statutory ability to give advice and consent. And as we move forward with this form of government, I think that as it relates to this issue and the issue previously regarding the budget direction is, are we a technicality? Are we a rubber stamp that's just there because we technically have to have it, we're, we're basically a pass-through? Or are we here to be a voice and represent our constituents? And I think that Dr. Young is not here tonight's suggestion of simply have being able to sit in on the interviews, ask people questions. Um, you know, he wouldn't be able to appoint the individual, the, the, the executive, but if we're gonna give our advice and consent, then we should have the informed advice portion of that. And I, and I don't think it's an unreasonable ask to simply have a seat at the table. <laughs>